I am now joined by a returning guest, Victor Brazone, and also a um, streamer who uh, who I, I like. I, I have uh, I have seen uh, some of his uh, his work before and on Twitter, but this is my first time meeting. Who refers to himself as a mouthy infidel? Uh, I'm going to have to get a Christian name here, man, because I. I, I <laughs> Well, funny enough, my name actually came from a Christian guy I was debating one time. <laughs> all right, all right. What, what, what do you want me to call you? Give me, give me a name. You can. Uh, my name is Ethan. You can just call me that. Ethan. There we go. All right, <laughs> all right. There we go. Um, I think uh, you know one of the reasons. You know, I was thinking about the the two people that we're watching uh, debating uh, tonight, and my various feelings about them. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I think that my you know my feeling for for destiny is best described as mild dislike, uh, which is I, I have to say a lot more generous than than what he most recently said about me publicly, which was that he fucking hated me. That's an exact <laughs> quote. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think part of that's probably because I did succumb to the uh, the, the temptation to uh, uh, to to crack a couple of jokes about uh, about the name Destiny. So uh, you know this this isn't this isn't just for you. This is a general <laughs> this is a general antithesis. Yeah, I, have I wouldn't say Destiny is. Like that. I wouldn't say he's very well known uh, for his generosity. If there was one virtue I would say he didn't have, it was like generosity when talking about other people. So I'm not surprised he called you that. <laughs> well. In any case, um, so I will say this is for the most part my first time watching this. I'm watching it with fresh eyes when it first happened. I think I watched like the first couple of minutes and I felt like mm. I had an idea, but uh, I will I'll power through the entire thing uh, for uh, for the sake of the uh, the viewers. Um, and and I think we actually have for the you know the panel here today, I, I think we have a um, uh, you know, I think, I think we have a, uh, a pretty good range of, of views I would expect. So, um, I, you know, I should also say, I guess, to be totally fair, the fucking, you know, the fucking hate, hate him. I fucking hate Ben Burgess comment, you know, was, was, was in the context of saying something nice. There was a button in yeah. that sentence. So it's, it's, not, <laughs> as, he, it's not as bad as could, but, uh, I think he really liked, he really liked your debate with Charlie Kirk, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, but, you know, there, there is, um, um, you know, we, we had, uh, I, I did debate the guy twice, um, uh, before all that, and you know, there there are very different memories of uh, of what happened uh, in uh, in those conversations, as as you know, has happened sometimes. Um, but uh, but I I think um, my my sense is that uh, Ethan, uh, d- despite you know, despite having a worldview, I think much closer to uh, Richard Wolf. Is uh, is much more friendly to the guy, and uh, and and Victor is somewhere in between. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I think like I find him to be like kind of a dick in his behavior, but I have to say there's like another more like I don't know adolescent part of me that does has enjoyed uh, some of his videos when he was like arguing against white nationalists and kind of sure, owning sure, sure. them. Like I like I, I sure. you know there's a part of me that really in- enjoys that, and I and I mm. think like some of his takes are not as bad as people mm. like think they are people on the left think they are because yeah. of just how unpleasant and how harsh and how ungenerous he can be. He's yeah. gotten like a really bad reputation, but I think he's got some decent views, but he's probably more mm. to the, to the center of me. Like I'm more to the left of him. So there's certainly views that, that I don't agree with him on, but yeah, that's basically my take. Mm. Fair enough. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, I'm sure that that's true. I think that that's true of everybody who like people online have strong opinions about that, you know, that, that there are like, 
maybe mildly bad takes that go through the telephone game that are turned into like monstrous takes. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's, that's kind of what always happens. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think on the personality question, I, I think probably said all there is to be said about that already. I think that on, I think politically, you know, like I think politically, my sense of the guy is always that he has, um, like on good days, he sounds like a decent social democrat, and on bad days, he sounds like the world's most annoying liberal. Yeah. Um, and you know, a lot, of, you know, sort of fluctuates between those poles. Um, I, I do think that, I do think something you actually told me, Victor, you know, off screen is probably true, which is that in a lot of ways, you know, not that he doesn't, you know whatever ego is tangled up in this stuff or whatever, you know, like, um, on generosity there is, I, I think actually in debates, I think one thing I will give him credit for it is, I think you're right. You know, that, that he is in some ways, you know, certainly by the standards of the medium, like not very performative. Like he, he does seem to be, um, uh, you know, he, he does, you know, he does actually mostly like do a, a fairly good job of, of focusing on the arguments. And and I have had that experience, you know, seeing him argue with somebody, you know, who, who has a view that I find, uh, um, you know, that I find horrifying and, and like being happy that he's the one who's arguing with them rather, rather than somebody like, you know, somebody who's like, does the, the YouTube Twitch leftist thing of, of just like, sort of performing for people who don't already like them and, you know, and, and sort of just doing insult comedy and not actually like breaking down what's wrong with what the person is saying. Yeah. He, I yeah. think he tries to, to stick to the argument and he's paradoxically seemingly very bad faith, but also good faith in other ways. It's kind of strange, mm. but sorry to cut you off, Ethan. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that, you know, if there's one complaint that I have about uh, destiny's character, it's that he, um, obviously can be hyper aggressive and often, you know, ungenerous to people he's talking about. Um, but at the same time, I generally take him to be um, at least intellectually honest mm -hmm. in the sense mm -hmm. of saying what he's actually thinking and not like uh, making maybe a, a bad argument just to look good or something or to come out looking like the winner of a debate. Uh, and he always has struck me as, as very genuine. Like, I don't think he would ever think something about me that he wouldn't say that you know, so, and, and I kind of appreciate those things, but yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, and, and I also fully expect, right, look, so uh, I've, I've copped to my mild dislike and, uh, and uh, I, I have, I have nothing but, um, you know, I have nothing but warm feelings about Richard Wolf. Uh, he has, uh, uh, he's been a guest on this show twice. Uh, you know, I, I used to see him, you know, and, and I, you know, would, would like interact with him on TMBS, um, was, uh, you know, I, I remember once, uh, when, um, you know, the, uh, the late great Michael, Michael Brooks, you know, loved the shit out of that guy. Uh, I remember him once privately, uh, referred to him as big Dick Wolf, uh, <laughs> as a, uh, you know, as a gesture of affection. Uh, but, uh, you know, but also I, I have, you know, I have seen quite a few of these, both of these guys in debates and I know what that's like. And, and I do expect, you know, I, I do think Professor Wolf does tend to be very like um, focused and passionate on his sort of original line of thought and sometimes very hard to like budge off of that. And, and I, I, you know, I would expect destiny to be like kind of a lot more nimble about like the, the sort of ins and outs of what's going on in like the course of an argument. So I'm, I, I would be shocked, you know, if, if he didn't, you know, like just to, just to sort of like crassly use this language here, right. I'd be pretty shocked if he didn't score some like real hits. Yeah. I think, um, my memory of this debate is that it was frustrating. Um, mm -hmm. like that, that there was, there were points that, that, like I really wanted them to talk about, but they, it felt like they were talking past each other. And I do think that he makes, mm. he made, if I remember correctly, some like nimble gotchas, I guess, but they were more about, if I remember correctly, just like not really sticking to certain points. But I mean, I, I felt dissatisfied when I originally mm. watched this with both people. And I like, you have quite a lot of affection for Richard Wolf. I think the first time I became aware of him was there was a random like Google talk that he gave maybe in like 2008 mm -hmm. or 2007. And I was like, 
how is this professor going to yeah how is this professor going to convince this room full of google employees to like you know potentially be sympathetic to socialism and i thought he did such a great job it was such a compelling talk at the time it was new to me um, mm -hmm. So, so I've always had affection for him since then. Although I've actually never read any of his work, I'm I'm curious if you have, if either of you have. I I never actually have, but yeah, I read Democracy at Work a couple of years ago. Okay, um, I also read Democracy at Work. Also, I think a couple of years ago, weirdly enough. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. have it anymore. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Nathan. Oh, sorry. My internet's cutting out a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, um. Yeah, I, I think I liked it. Um, I, I mean, I actually, in the last conversation I had with him, I think I did realize that we probably do have like bigger disagreements, especially about strategy that that I I had I had previously assumed. But yeah, I, I like Democracy at Work. I, I thought it was a good book. I think it's like. Um, I think it's very accessible and it's, and, and, um, you know, I, I think it's like a nothing but positive, you know, that, that it's, it's, uh, it's out there. Right. You know, and, and even, even though, um, you know, I, I do think, you know, like I probably have like, at least what I got out of that last conversation that, um, that, uh, professor Wolf probably does have a, like, I've probably got much more of a sort of like, old line Marxist view about the sort of role of the state, uh, than, uh, that, that he does. Right. You know, like, like I think in, in terms of thinking about how, uh, you know, of how a, a, a transition to, to a different kind of economy could, um, you know, could happen. Um, although we only kind of like skimmed the surface of that, you know, in that, in that debate, you know, it wasn't a debate, but in that conversation, uh, you know, but, but I also think it's like, yeah, I mean, I think he's, I think he's a really like, I think he's both a compelling speaker and an entertaining speaker, and and you know, and, and very and very knowledgeable. And I, I think it's, I think it's nothing but positive that this guy has such a, a high profile sort of like telling people about worker cooperatives and you know things like you know, um, and and things like that. I, I don't see any way that could possibly be bad. Um, so I, sh I should also say, uh, he actually might be coming back on the show in april to for a conversation that i would actually just be refereeing uh we're, we're trying we're trying to set this up so i could so he can nice. he could argue with um with bronco marketich about uh about vaccine mandates so um so i i think that'll be really interesting if it happens you know but um yeah but yeah all right yeah. um so we're doing yeah. this in two parts, right? So we'll do the first, we'll try to get through, I guess, half of it, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Although it's actually, it's not as long as I remembered it being. Okay. Uh, now that I'm actually looking at the video, like in my memory, this thing was ridiculous and there was no way we were possibly doing it. And okay. in one go, I still suspect that's probably going to be two parts. I should also ask um, if, if you guys remember if like the entire video is the is the debate or if there's like some section where they're just taking chat questions or anything like that. There is a pretty lengthy Q and a, I think. Okay. Oh. And, and is it the kind of thing where the, the Q like there's like the sort of um, there's like the debate between the two of them and then the rest of it's Q and a, or does it like kind of come back to being the, the two of them later? They, so they kind of like, it is, I think, just like them debating. From my memory, I haven't seen it in a, in quite a while. But from what I remember, there was like a part where they were debating and then they were taking questions for the chat and they would kind of like spend like five minutes-ish debating like the mm. questions they were getting from chat. But um, I don't think it went back to the normal debate format after that. Okay, in that case, we might be able to do it all tonight because usually when we watch a debate... And like the debate is just over, and then there's like a Q and A portion. Uh, we usually skip the Q and A, but on the other hand, if your if your memory is that the Q and A was particularly good, you know, then then we'll we'll you know we'll do it. But um, we can maybe we can make a judgment call at the uh, at the end of tonight's session about whether we need to do a part two. Yeah, but, if my, if my yeah. memory serves me, uh, it depends on what your definition of good is. But I, th <laughs> I think there might have been. 
uh, quite a lot of, I guess, spicy moments in the Q and A, but I don't know. It was also a while. So, I mean, I guess it depends on what we, what we want to, what we want to do or what we want, what we judge is good, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, Hey, let's, uh, let's, let's get started. All right. Okay, welcome guys, gals, and empals to what is being described as the biggest event in the history of the Terminally Online. The great debate will shortly commence between two titans in their respective fields. We'd like to first and, foremo uh, first and foremost thank Democracy at Work, as well as Economic Update for helping us schedule and book the good professor, and Destiny and his community for participating as well. We'd also like to thank the Rational National, who is hosting the event on YouTube, for those afraid of the Twitch platform. And finally, politics.gg uh, Discord, where they are hosting the debate of the debate, because the internet is constantly trying to out-meta itself. The rules are very simple. Both participants have agreed to approach this conversation in the best of faith. We'll be giving uh, three-minute opening statements in which they will both give defense of their arguments. This will be followed by a girthy hour-long open forum between the two of them, followed by a 20 to 30-minute audience Q&A, and finally, closing statements. If you'd like to participate in any point in the audience Q&A, please head over to twitch.tv slash TV and hit exclamation point debate in the chat. There will be a link to a form you can fill out uh, that will be made available. While donations are always appreciated, please be aware donating does not mean that your questions will be read. The only way to participate in the Q&A is going through the Google Doc form that we have uh, provided. Finally, we will ask that everyone in everyone's respective chats please avoid the use of anything that would either violate twitch or youtube's terms of service keep the discussion to being as productive and as lightning as only the internet knows how to do it is now my pleasure to introduce today's competitors arguing in favor of socialism is richard d wolf a professor of economics who's previously taught at yale and is also the host of economic update as well as democracy at work he's authored several books on both marxism and socialism as well as a recent one covering the COVID epidemic called the sickness is the system arguing in favor of capitalism is stephen bonnell ii known under the pseudonym destiny he began as a professional starcraft 2 player and went on to revolutionize politics on the Twitch streaming platform. He's gone on to debate many of the largest public figures on both the right and the left corners of the political spectrum. Recently, he's been uh, become involved in campaigning for local politicians, and while his detractors on both sides have labeled him either a communist or a fascist, he prefers the moniker as the omni-liberal. Both contestants prefer he, him pronouns. Thank you so much for joining us. Without further ado, since he's arguing for a change to the current paradigm, we will begin with you, Professor Richard Wolf. Okay, in the three minutes I have, I cannot speak as fast as you just did, so I won't even try. I'll try to make a couple of basic points. Every economic system in the history of the world displays the following pattern. It is born, it evolves over time, and then it dies and passes away, giving way to another one. And part of that process has always been the conviction of the people in each economic system that sooner or later they can, they should, and they will do better, overcome some of the problems and difficulties they're facing, and organize a system that better meets human needs. The process is sometimes relatively smooth, other times it's rocky. That varies with the conditions and particularly with the level of resistance from those who don't want to see the system change and shift. Capitalism, in my judgment, has been born, most would agree, has evolved over the last three centuries or so, and is now at that last stage. The only question now is exactly how and when the passing occurs. Likewise, in my judgment, the yearning for something better has built up in capitalism to a pretty intense level now. Whether you look at the debts of students, whether you look at the mind-bending inequality that this system generates over and over again, unless and until it is revolted against by masses of people who do something about the inequality only to discover that as long as capitalism remains, the tendency to inequality resumes. I think people are also tired of the instability. Every four to seven years, capitalism crashes. We've had three in this new century in its 20 years. Yep, right on schedule, every four to seven years. 
Millions lose their jobs. Businesses go belly up. Cities and towns can't get the revenue they need to provide the services we depend on. One sign of the exhaustion of this system, a level of money creation, a level of debt creation, we have never seen. Government debt, corporate debt, personal debt. The system is exhausted and the entire private enterprise system is now on 24 seven government life support. I think it's over. I think that's difficult for us all to live through. And we better learn some lessons from the British Empire from which they have been tumbling for a century. We could and should do better on the downswing than the British have been able to. And the more we talk about it and discuss it and explore it, the better our chances to make another progressive transition to a better system that we all need and will benefit from. Okay, Destiny. Oof, are you keeping us on a timer? I am. All right. As of March 2021, Americans rank the economy, job markets, the handling of the coronavirus, and leadership in Washington as the four most important challenges facing our country. Socialist policies would not alleviate any of these concerns. Countries have tried the socialist experiment. Time and time again, this has failed. Doctors in Cuba moonlight as taxi drivers. Countries with socialized health care haven't fared much better than the U.S. in their handling of the coronavirus. And any socialist re regime will necessarily involve the bureaucracy of Washington even more heavily in our economy. Any country that has attempted to realize a fully socialist economy has either failed completely, such as in the case of the USSR, destroyed large swaths of their economy, such as in Venezuela, or been forced to embrace more neoliberal economic policies to realize true growth in their economy, such as in China or Vietnam. Liberal market policies work better in both theory and practice when it comes to efficiently allocating resources to maximizing the economic productivity of any country, and we've seen this play out time and time again across a wide variety of markets and countries throughout history across the globe. Oftentimes, people like Richard Wolff bring up the boom-bust cycle as though it's an inherent flaw of capitalism, but I believe I speak for most when I say that a boom-bust cycle is preferable to just going bust as so many socialist countries have. It's also important for us to realize that no economic organization is in and of itself inherently moral or immoral, but rather we ought to view them as tools to effect some greater output for our country that we can later utilize and distribute in the most fair manner with government policy to most of our citizens as we see fit, creating a bigger a bigger pie, so to speak, from which all of us can eat. Morality and justice should exist in the realm of government policy. We cannot allow it to blind us to the economic reality surrounding us. No matter how much we wish a wild lion not to eat us, our desire alone will never satiate its appetite. While socialism may sound good in theory, the destruction it would rot on the wealth of our country and the oppressive restrictions it would place on our businesses would not help the vast majority of Americans. It would be foolish to enforce protectionist or socialist policies on our economy while major developing economies, such as India and China, are moving in the exact opposite direction, having realized time and time again the failures in socialist planning. Socialism implies two major things, a change in both the means and mode of production. The means of production change in such a way to completely disallow private investment or ownership, and a change in the mode of production such that we no longer produce goods and services for a profit. Instead, businesses are only started with the approval of some governmental body, some kind of central planning, when the equal decision making and management of every worker and the goods and services produced in any society are what some government body hates, irrespective of market forces or the wants and desires of the citizens. It's likely in the course of the debate that my opponent will suggest we take after Nordic or Western European countries, setting that things like socialized healthcare or subsidized education are powerful programs that address many of the underserved needs of Americans today. While this is true, I would like to remind everyone who spent the last decade reading conservatives that the government simply providing welfare has absolutely nothing to do with socialism. My opponent believes that strong social safety nets and welfare programs are important parts of the government. Most liberals who welcome him with open arms, me included. Consequentially, there are five major hurdles that no socialist I have ever spoken to has adequately addressed, and they are as follows. Number one, what level of violence is acceptable for you to reach our socialist state? Number two, how do we decide which businesses are allowed to exist in a socialist society without allowing private capital investment? Three, is any form of investment whatsoever allowed in a socialist society for an expansion of business? Four, how are labor markets determined in a a socialist society? And five, how do we calculate which goods and services a nation needs if we do away with the commodity form? Those are my five. Cool. All right. So we're going to do the open format now for the next hour. All right, so I don't want to uh, generally stop um, after increments this small, but since since we did just do the time to open in statements, uh, this seems like a very natural time to do that. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I mean, it's funny. My my girlfriend is watching, and she just texted me that uh, 
and she doesn't know Richard Wolf at all. She's not familiar. And, and she was just saying, you know, it makes me so sad to see Wolf talk so slow. You know, he seems like he's out of his league, not built. And I was saying her to her, like, don't worry, like he's a socialist bulldog. He'll hold his own. Like he's he's feisty. Um, so that's uh, that's funny. Um, but I think, like, generally speaking, the opening statements are like, I mean, I don't have much to say about them. I think they like they they kind of like teased the their initial positions. But uh, yeah, those are my initial thoughts anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, I was kind of just like frantically like writing down points as they were coming uh, to see if I could, you know, look back and have anything to say. Um, I think that um, there's I mean, I kind of was was somewhat unsatisfied with, I guess, both opening statements, um, but I'm not sure how much how in depth we want to go into all the individual yeah, okay. arguments. I mean, I think we can go reasonably in depth i mean i'll i'll say that um i mean whatever i i like uh <laughs> uh i mean honestly like i i have you know I'll, I'll just use the phrase mildly dislike again like 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 i have a bad instinctive reaction to uh the the rapid fire you know twitch debate style you know like like just just talk at a normal pace right like just just be you know be like a person having a conversation but um but i think that wolf in his opening uh you know i i don't i mean it was three minutes and he was speaking at a normal pace so there wasn't that much there he he said uh he brought up the you know boom bust cycles of capitalism as an objection to capitalism pretty standard stuff and and beyond that it was just kind of um general musing on the the birth and death of economic systems uh they were like destiny's opening seemed a lot more packed with with arguments although i've got to say um i i mean a lot of these seem like the kind of arguments that you you expect um i mean like literally there some of this stuff is like what you would hear from ben shapiro right like 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 i the thing that was most shocking to me was that he brought up venezuela which like it it just seems like come on dude that's that's you know that is you know like venezuela you know if if um if socialism means as you know as as, as some of destiny's arguments implied like the sort of ultra advanced kind of communist society of the 23rd century with no commodity form then clearly there's never been a socialist country. Uh, but if it just means like an economy based on state ownership, then Venezuela is less socialist than France. I mean, like that that's, uh, you know, like at the height of Hugo Chavez's welfare state, the actual percentage of Venezuelans working for the public sector was lower than the percentage of French people working for the public sector. Not that much higher than the percentage of Americans working for public sector and way lower than the Nordics. And, you know, the, certainly the social services are way more expansive than Nordic countries, you know, so, so I mean, it's just like the Venezuela argument, I, I, I have to say, was, you know, was disappointing from my perspective. Yeah. And I mean, in addition to that, um, even if we, I mean, even if we granted that Venezuela was some version of socialism, um, I mean, it just seems clear to me that the conditions that led to Venezuela collapsing didn't have much to do with anything that could be considered like related to socialism to whatever extent they had it. Um, I mean, my understanding is that for the most part, uh, Venezuela had a largely oil dependent economy, oil prices fell, then they engaged in excessive money printing and that created hyperinflation. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't seem to me uh obvious that you know how much money printing a country engages in when it finds itself in an edgy situation is, is somehow a metric for how socialist it is i mean in some ways it actually seems like the opposite to me because <laughs> uh the, one would think that the um the socialist uh th you know thing to do would, would, would be you know wealth redistribution and you know and, and money printing is sort of an end run around actually doing uh you know doing more of that but yeah, again, I mean, if like if you think that like Venezuela's economic problems were caused by it being too socialist, like it, you know, unless you're just defining bad monetary policy as being socialist, like what else, right? Like, it's not the extent of state ownership because there's way more state ownership of the economy in a country like Norway, for example, which is actually a really good one-to-one -one analogy because in both cases the size of the state sector is really inflated by the fact that they're, uh, you know 
countries with lots of oil that have state-run oil companies. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not that. It's not that the social services are, are too generous because, again, their Nordic countries have way more generous social services. So whether you think it's the bad monetary policy, uh, which is a pretty mainstream explanation, I think, of Venezuela's like economic meltdown, or you think, you know, you you go like you sort of do the um, the kind of more fervently anti-imperialist thing and say, oh, it's all sort of sanctions and sabotage. Or you do the like Venezuelan like right wing exile angry thing and say it's all like sort of government corruption. On any of those three explanations or any combination of like thinking there are elements of truth to the three, like one way or the other or the other, it has nothing to do with socialism. Um, also, this this argument that um, countries with socialized healthcare systems didn't do that much better with with COVID. Uh, I mean, first, that just seems false to me. But like, I mean, I guess there's a little bit of wiggle room with that much. But also, even to the extent that it's true, I mean, isn't that because like the United States implemented um, essentially single payer a la carte for COVID? You know that the uh, that uh, you know you don't have to pay for COVID treatment. You know you don't have to pay, you know pay for you know for for COVID testing. Uh, you don't have to pay for COVID vaccine vaccines. Right? It's all provided by the government. So it's like saying like. Yeah, with this one specific crisis that like we we handled with like doses of socialized medicine, countries with an overall system of socialized medicine didn't do that much better. Although also, like in the same breath, he's mentioning uh, he's mentioning Cuba and granted this is like a year ago, and I'm not sure where the rates were then, but like mm-hmm. I believe Cuba has uh, like one of the best vaccination rates in the world right now, which you know which presumably is not to- i mean look obviously it's like weird and messy and multi-causal like what causes vaccine hesitancy you know whether you you know like uh everybody's got their favorite story for you know for what that is and there's probably like a little bit of truth to a lot of them but like you know i, I don't think it's unrelated that like lots of lots of americans um you know people who have got vaccinated are disproportionately uninsured and like you know lots of americans like just don't have like relationships with doctors whose advice they trust right whereas like everybody in cuba does because it's got like the best doctor patient ratio literally in the entire world so i mean I, i'm not like i'm not going to be a tanky about it. i think there are plenty of things about cuba that deserve criticism but like um but you know the fact that doctors you know, the fact that doctors aren't that well paid, like, doesn't really strike me as one of them. Like, it actually seems like, well, hey, I mean, I don't know, still seems like a lot of Cubans want to be doctors, right? Maybe we don't actually have to uh, compensate doctors that much to uh, to to have uh, to have lots of people signing up for it. I mean, if so, that kind of sounds like a good thing to me. Hmm. Yeah, I um, I had a couple points to make yeah. about um, uh. You mentioned the oil sector of oil sectors of Norway and Venezuela, and I think that's a good um, that's a, a relevant connection. And I think we can take that analogy even further, right? Um, so Matt Brunig has made this point before, um, where basically um, two relevant respects in which Norway and Venezuela are very similar is their um, oil. Uh, large government uh, oil sectors. Um, but I mean, if you look at how each country uses that oil money, um, Venezuela basically just uses their oil money to fund current government social spending, uh, whereas Norway uses their oil money to build up a collectively owned capital stock, which then goes to fund uh, current social programs. So even if you just want to look at how they use their oil sector, insofar as socialism has to do with collective ownership of capital, uh, it seems like Norway comes away as as far more socialist uh, than Venezuela. Yeah, no, that's that is a that is a very good point. Um, I, li- I like that a lot. I, I would just say uh, thank you for the super chat, uh, Huckleberry Sin uh, message received. So uh, I think that uh, I think that I mean I did also just want to say on his sort of five like challenges. Uh, Destiny's five challenges to socialists. Um, the like four of them have to do with the sort of nuts and bolts of how a socialist economy would work, and I think it just kind of is going to wildly vary depending on like what model of socialism you have in mind. Like some of them are just going to be irrelevant to some, and you know, and and others are going to be irrelevant to others. Um, but and also, I you know, I really didn't like the bureaucracy thing. I think it depends a little bit on what he means. 
but I, I, I think certainly to the extent that we're talking about things like universal social programs, which is a little unclear, right? Like I, I think the target here is very nebulous, but like to the extent that we're talking about that, I'd argue that the opposite is true, that uh, that uh, means testing empowers bureaucrats. But but the the fifth, so the first of the challenges, right? It was, it was the first of the five. Uh, and, and the one that I sort of bristled at the most was like sort of was the what, what level of violence is acceptable to to bring about socialism and, and it just seems to me that that cuts uh at least equally well both ways right that they that it's like well okay i mean how what level of violence do you think is justifiable to preserve yeah. capitalism which is not exactly uh a hypothetical right i mean that there have uh uh you know like quite a bit of the worst violence that happened in the 20th century you know was precisely committed you know some of it was committed by stalinists in the name of socialism, but like quite a bit of it was committed uh, in the name of preserving capitalism for the threat of socialism. I mean, starting with the Nazis, right? I mean, that was the official justification to prevent, you know, to prevent communist revolution and, you know, going through, you know, Pinochet and Chile, you know, which, um, you know, relatively small in terms of overall body count by global standards, but still very, very bad. And, and like one of the worst, like mass murders of the 20th century, you know, Suharto in Indonesia. I mean, you know, that, that was, um, you know, that's the Jakarta method, right. That that's, uh, that's definitely in the name of preserving Indonesian capitalism, you know, from, from socialist threats. So I don't, I don't understand, you know, I mean, it, it seems like whether we're talking about like slavery with the American civil war or socialism with Chile, you know, violence is at least as often committed to preserve existing social systems as to alter them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the the better question would have been like, what level of like state coercion do you need to like maintain a certain kind of Mm. market? Like, Mm. as opposed to, I guess, of course, there's all kinds of like indirect coercion that happens as a result of capitalism. But I guess the idea is like you kind of give people the incentives and then it kind of like works. And then a better question as opposed to violence, I guess, would just be, well, how much like like coercion are you going to actually to to make people, for example, I guess it's going to come up later in the debate. And it is a question that I I wonder about. I haven't read Wolf's Wolf's book, mm-hmm. obviously, but I guess to to get uh, companies to change to become more worker owned, right? It's like, what level it, of, of 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 like coercion, like legal coercion, do you need to make that the case? I guess right. Uh, and and that's not something Wolf gets into in Democracy at Work. Um, and actually, my sense from my last conversation with him is 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 that he's actually probably. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's probably, uh, less coercive in his instincts than I am, you know, that the, that like, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think just the way that markets work, you know, there's, there's absolutely no way that you're going to transition from a, from a normal capitalist economy to a predominantly, uh, to a predominantly worker own one, uh, without, without that happening, mostly as a result of state policy. Um, whereas I, I think he thinks that, um, that a lot, you know, I, I think that he thinks that a lot more of that could happen, you know, kind of within existing, uh, existing legal arrangements. I've never really, you know, I mean, it, it's a little hard to say, right. I, I, I think he, I think he sort of gives different impressions at different times, which is not an accusation of like dishonesty. It's just that like, I'm not totally sure, you know, what, mm-hmm. what, what his position is, but I, I think, but the last conversation, I got the impression that like, he, I don't know. He rarely. I'll, I guess I'll just say this. I think he rarely seems to go further than like the sort of um, Corbyn supported policy of like basically pref, you know, basically um, giving workers the right of first refusal for uh, buying up companies that are about to go bankrupt or outsource, you know, with state provided funds. Like he rarely seems to go further than that, and I, I think you would have to go a lot further than that. But that said. I would also argue, I mean, Ethan brought up uh, Matt Bruning earlier. Like, I'm also pretty convinced by Matt Bruning's arguments about coercion that, like, look, it, it's if we're just talking about forcing people to do things just as a value, right, you know, without thinking about how much violence that, that you know, sort of takes, like, all systems of distribution of scarce resources are equally based on, on coercion, right? I mean, there's, there's no, like, the, you know, Whatever I, I won't I won't repeat this. People people have heard me say this a hundred times, but you know, read Matt Brunig. Uh, I, I find him very persuasive on this point. But we've probably talked about the openings <laughs> enough. We should uh, we should watch some of the actual open discussion. Yeah. Our um, 
I don't think I'm going to need to moderate too much as long as both of you just say something and allow the other person to speak and don't talk over each other. It should be fine. So uh, I guess begin uh, now. Where do you want to start? Well, let, can, let I, can I respond to what was said? Yeah, of course. Yeah, whatever you want to do, yeah. Okay. Um, I find this a laughable caricature of anything I've ever written or anything that I understand uh, is part of this conversation. And I don't appreciate being told what I think or what I say or what I mean or what I intend. I can speak for myself and that would just be fine if we could allow each other to do that, number one. Number two, I have no idea what this uh, silly remark that I hear so often is that no socialist society has succeeded at anything. I have no idea what you're talking about. Let me give you an example. One of the most important metrics used in the economics profession around the world to assess the quote unquote success of an economic system is the rate of economic growth. You measure GDP and you look at how it grows over time. And then you compare one country to another to assess their relative success, not as societies, because that's a vague generality, but at this particular metric, which we use in economics to measure economic growth over time. It's not the only metric, but it's a widely used one. So I'm now going to use it. In the 20th century, the fastest growing metric, the fastest growing GDP in any country measured was the Soviet Union. And in the 21st century we're living in, the fastest growing GDP in the world has been the People's Republic of China. This is not an endorsement of one or another economic system. It's a statement of fact verified by any reliable source of information. The UN, the project in the University of California, Berkeley, and others who keep track of this. So this has to be understood because in much of the world, economic growth is a shared objective and goal that these two societies have excelled at achieving, number one. Number two, when it comes to socialism, it would be useful if we all understood what the word means rather than playing around with caricatures. For example, the notion that socialism is all about what the government does has been contested throughout the history of socialism. And that idea is less dominant within the socialist tradition now than it ever was over the last 150 years. For example, today, one of the most important issues for socialists has to do not with government regulation, not with government owning and operating businesses, not with these bugaboos of bureaucracy and all the rest of it, but has to do with an objective of transforming the organization of production in a factory, in an office, in a store, not to have a small group of people, the owner, the board of directors, the tiny little minority at the top that is a dictatorial power inside an enterprise, making all the key decisions that the employees have to live with, even though the minority making those decisions is not accountable to those employees. That's a socialism of transformation at the micro level about which very little could have been discerned in the comments preceding these. If we're going to talk about socialism, then we have to talk about what it means to the people pushing for it and urging it. And those people have learned from the 20th and 21st century, just like those who pushed for capitalism three centuries ago learned from their early experiments, how to refine, how to adjust, and how to change. To pretend that that didn't happen, to trade in old and shrinking conceptions of socialism may be good debating ploy, but it doesn't advance our understanding of anything. Um, okay, if you want, it'd be easier to have a more of a back and forth rather than uh, the super long uh, monologues so we can respond to each other more, if you're okay with that. Um, 
just for for a couple of things that you said. So uh, I'm trying just, not to miss. I just oh, talk slower than you. Oh yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> my understanding is that um, in the 20th century there was a faster growing economy than the USSR, and it was Japan. Japan still exists today, and the USSR does not. I understand that the USSR did show a huge amount of growth, but I think it's odd to use that as an example when socialists often point to the evils of imperialism um, and when you point out the fact that everybody was heavily industrial around that time as well. I don't think it's fair to say that the USSR simply grew on the merit of socialism uh, when there were so many other things happening at the time and it was outgrown by an economy that but was- those are, the, those are the facts. I mean, you, you can play whatever games you want. The fact of the matter is that the Soviet Union's performance in the 20th century completely outshines that of Japan. There's no comparison. In 1917, when the Soviet Union begins, it is the poorest country in Europe by far. It then goes through 70 years of a lost World War I, of a civil war, of an agricultural collectivization, and of World War II, which did more damage in Russia than in any other country. None, notwithstanding, that it was the poorest country at the beginning of this horrific story, it ends up in 1965 being the number one competitor of the United States for global hegemony. That's only because of its number one status in economic growth that it achieved the overcoming of all those horrific losses. I'm not arguing in favor of this or that about the Soviet Union. But the fact of its achievement is a staggering reality that you can dance around from here to tomorrow, but it doesn't go away because it's inconvenient to confront it. And the same thing is true now. If you read Pearl Buck's novels about China before the revolution, you will hear about a society whose depth of poverty literally blows your mind. And here they are about to surpass the United States before the end of this decade. And that was accomplished by a communist revolution and a government that has been run by a communist party to this day. And yeah, for sure, they cleverly opened their society up to capitalists to come and join them. But to imagine that the achievement of the Chinese uh, economy is purely due to the private capitalists rather than to the state economy. That's making believe because you need to have an argument that puts the success at the credit of one or the other, the infrastructure, the training of the mass of people. Everything that happened in China is as much a product of the planning and policies of the communist government than of any other factor. And that has to be recognized as well. And none of this is an endorsement. That society has strengths and weaknesses. It has things we can criticize, but we can't make it up because it's inconvenient to face the successes they've had and continue to have. Okay, so I'm not saying that the USSR did not grow a lot. Obviously the USSR grew massively. Your claim is not that the USSR grew. That's not what we're arguing about. It's whether or not the USSR grew at the rate that it did due to socialism. A country that was heavily involved in multiple famines, a country that heavily went from little industrialization to a lot of industrialization, and a country that engaged in a lot of imperialistic practices um, is a country that grew massively in the 20th century. To say that all of their growth or even the majority of their growth was due to the organization of their economy and not due to factors that were independent of that organization, to say otherwise that they wouldn't have grown maybe at an even faster rate had they been a capitalist economy, um, there would have to be some evidence provided for that. And I don't believe that that's ever been adequately demonstrated. On the contrary, I believe some people have argued that, the, that Russia could potentially grow, the US could have potentially grown even faster had it abandoned some of its more outdated forms of trying to manage their economy. Um, when we bring up China, China has grown a lot under certain social policies for sure. When we look at China, especially in the 80s and 90s, China began opening itself up to massive growth when it comes to foreign investment. China is the number two country in the world that allows for foreign direct investment. And the coalescing of all of China's state-owned, the SOE's state-owned enterprises into a select few industries, and then the massive opening of foreign investment into that country to give other people more control over 
of business has what has caused the massive explosion that we've seen of China in terms of pulling people out of global poverty, as you mentioned in uh, the video that you did for the Gravel Institute. You attribute that to socialist policies, but the thing that really pulled China into the 21st century in terms of economic success was the opening itself up to foreign direct investment, was the opening itself up to other economies being able to interact with them more, which are all neoliberal trade policies. These aren't, these aren't people-owned businesses. These aren't businesses that are ran by the workers. These are, I mean, if anything, China is a, is a government that runs the business itself. That was a state capitalist uh, economy more so than any type of socialist or communist uh, economy. To say that a single party regime is, is having the workers themselves making decisions over how the, any, any individual business is, is uh, running, I don't think it's fair to say. Um, I guess one really, of the, really, quick, just finishing. Your just understanding of China, it, your just, understanding just, of China, though, finish, is really badly flawed. Right. Can I finish this, just this last part? The, the thing that confuses me the most and the thing that frustrates me the most, I guess, when I have discussions with socialists is socialism feels like this, like this very amorphous, ever transforming idea of what it actually is such that I don't even know why we use the word anymore. So I'm very glad that you've acknowledged that Marx in, in through his labor uh, theory value analysis was absolutely flawed and was an absolute failure. I'm glad that you've acknowledged that the way of I analyzing- I have not acknowledged you're making this stuff up. I've never acknowledged anything of the work of the sort. Okay, well, the, wait, I don't even you, know where you, you get you, this. Well, earlier you just said that we shouldn't hold ourselves captive to the thinking of, of thinkers in the 19th century in terms of what socialism is. So I assume well, you evolved your- No, no, I didn't do that at all. I told that socialism has a variety of theory within. It's a broad tradition. It had to be in the 150 years since Marx wrote, his ideas had moved into every country on this earth at different levels of economic and cultural and political life. And of course, those different people all found something valuable, but they all made their own interpretations. This is a rich, diverse tradition. It's as if you, you're gonna decide, is I mean when I see these things, I never said that the Marxist theory isn't valuable, that the labor theory of value doesn't apply. If you read any of the books and articles I've pumped out in my life, you'd know that the exact opposite is the case. And can I you, want to you, correct you something. Say, Wait a minute. I want to correct something about China because you keep repeating it. Okay. You know why private enterprise and private capital flows into China in the 80s and 90s? Because China had transformed itself from a place where nobody wanted to invest to a place like now where everybody does. Capitalist enterprises went there because they had a well-educated, disciplined labor force at very low wages because they had built an extraordinary infrastructure because you had a growing level of income for people to buy things. That's why General Motors pr produces and sells more cars in China than it does in the United States. The reason private capital went there was because they had, before the arrival, created the institutions. Every other part of so-called third world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, who had received since the Second World War massive amounts of foreign aid were desperately trying to do what the Chinese were doing, namely develop their country so that foreign private investment would come. China didn't get any foreign aid because they were communists and the United States didn't give them any. But they did a better job than all the countries who did get it in order to get to the point of economic development where it became interesting for capitalists in Japan and Europe to go there. You need to pretend, for reasons I do not understand, that all of the achievements I've just described didn't happen, that somehow they don't deserve the credit. Look, in the world of economics, maybe perhaps you're not familiar, we do exactly what you just said we oughtn't to do. We look at societies and say, they have a capitalist economic system, how did they do? And they have a socialist system with the different meanings of that term, and how did they do? And then we say, they're different, and part, not all, part of the story is the different system. And if I say to you that the tr socialist transition uh, tradition has multiple interpretations, let me assure you that the capitalist tradition does as well. The leaders of Saudi Arabia right now call themselves capitalists. Can you I know, can I ask you, when you say socialist, what do you 
what do you mean when you say socialist then? I'm trying to understand what this means. Can you well, give me like a cohesive, tried, coherent? That's good. No, let, let me answer. There are a variety. I'll give you three basic strains right now. They don't exhaust it, but they re- enable us to have a conversation. One strain, you leave enterprises in the hands of private capitalists, but you recognize that that capitalist system is so flawed, for example, in terms of inequality, in terms of business cycle instability, that you give a role to the government of massive intervention, rules, regulations, laws. You know, let me give you some examples. In France, it's the law that once you begin working after graduating from high school or college, every employer has to give you five weeks of paid vacation from the beginning. Nothing like that exists in the United States. But this is a society that won that for its people by the way, by socialists who did that and put that on the books as it is on most European countries. And socialists do that because they believe for them that socialism is when the government comes in and regulates. That's one kind. Here's a second kind. These second kind of socialists, they don't believe it works real well if you do that. It's not enough. So they want to take a different step. They want the government to come in and actually own and operate enterprises, not merely regulate them with rules and laws. Then there's a third kind, which I stressed a few moments ago, which is not about the government, doesn't care all that much whether the government runs an enterprise or the private does. They can figure out whichever one works better. Let's be real practical. But for them, what socialism means is the transformation of the everyday life of working people. No longer do you go to work with other people telling you what to do, where to sit, what machine to use, what raw material to work on. And at the end of the day, you go home and you've got nothing more to say about what you poured your brains and muscles into. No, no, no. For these socialists like me, the crucial thing is to reorganize the workplace to bring real democracy, can you believe it, to the place where we work. In a country that claims to be democratic, we don't have democracy in the workplace. We have a tiny group of people telling the majority what to do, fully unaccountable to that majority. You know, if we really believed in democracy, this kind of socialism argues, we would recognize that that's where adults spend most of their adult life, at work. And if you really believe in democracy, it should have been installed in the workplace. But capitalism doesn't permit that. The folks at the top want to keep the power to keep their inordinate wealth, even at the expense of no democracy and of a growth record inferior to what Russia did in the 20th century and what China is doing now. And that's an enormous price to pay. Okay, so. Yeah, there's a lot, there is a lot going on there. I think, I think like one of the things that I found a bit frustrating, uh. is like, I don't, I don't really personally find the debates, like the kind of empirical historical debates about mm. like, what, you know, how successful was China? Like how, how productive, like how, how much production was it? Like to me, it's just such an uninteresting question at least. Cause like for me, like a socialism, the target, the interesting question is like, what exactly are we trying to build? Mm-hmm. Um, and like the, to the extent to which to, for me, like anything that is the kind of socialism that I'm interested in has to have some kind of like democratic legitimacy, some kind of like democratic self-managed legitimacy. So I feel like having this like debate about the empirical facts about how productive Russia wa- or the USSR was, how productive about China, it just seems to like miss the mark about what at least I think the interesting question is. And I mean, I know that Wolf does say you know, there's kind of the question about the historical success of places like the USSR and China, Uh, but then like the type that, you know, he mentions earlier that socialists today are much more interested in sort of like, how do we change um, production in a democratic way? Right. And I think that's kind of the kind of socialism that's interesting, which I think they eventually get to, but, but it's just, uh, yeah. So I just find myself watching this and I'm like, okay, well, when is the interesting question we're going to get, when are we going to get to like the interesting bit? Like, Yeah. We can have debates about history and like like how how productive was japan versus but it's like eh, i don't know mm. yeah i i think that there are sort of like two things that jumped out to me uh regarding the the historical argument i mean the first is just that um i mean i'm kind of with destiny when it comes to i think 
pointing to the fact that the USSR was socialist and experienced a lot of growth, I feel like more work needs to be done before you like show that the relationship is causal between socialism and growth. Um, because obviously someone who's, you know, pre-empirical investigation inclined to think that socialism isn't good for growth, they're likely going to attribute the USSR's growth to other factors. So I feel like you kind of have to like make an additional argument to, you know, have this sort of appeal be like dialectically effective, I guess. Um, and I guess with respect to China, the thing that kind of bothers me about that is um, I feel like even if we grant Richard's point that mm -hmm. Um, China basically did all this development and then it made them attracted to capitalist investors. Well, presumably Richard Wolff's socialist strategy isn't to develop to the point where the United States becomes more attractive to capitalist investors in other countries. Um, presumably it's, it's something more than that. So the fact that uh, China was effective at building to the point where it could attract investors, I don't see how that really supports probably the kind of socialist uh, project that Richard Wolff is, is pushing for. Yeah. Uh, so, so I do definitely agree with Victor that it's um, that like the least interesting thing you can do in a live debate is, is to, is to argue about the historical facts um, for, for one thing, um, you know, if any, like anytime somebody's bringing in new to you information, uh, you don't have time to, you know, like, like you can like do like a three second Google search, maybe, you know, if, if it's a, if it's happening on YouTube instead of live. Uh, but you know, that's, that's not going to tell you very much. Uh, it's, it's going to be very, like, I think for a variety of reasons, you know, like live debates are just a bad format for that. Like, I think it's way more interesting if uh, you're focusing on, on inference, right. In, in, instead of, uh, instead of facts, because for one thing, I mean, it's what the audience is best, um, is best equipped to actually judge in the moment. Uh, and, and it's, and I think you're just going to have more, I mean, I mean, obviously it's not going to be all on one or the other, like there's no avoiding, you know, like, like if somebody just makes a wildly wrong factual claim and, and everything they're saying hinges on it, uh, then, you know, then, I mean, there, there might be no avoiding going back and forth about that, but like to the extent you can, I kind of think you should. Cause, uh, cause it's just, I mean, I, I, I think it's not going to, you're not going to have a good conversation. It's not going to be good for the audience. If you're just like insisting on, you know, insisting on what the facts are one way or the other. Um, I, I guess I have mixed feelings about the China and Russia examples, because on the one hand, um, I do think it's a little unclear what those examples you're supposed to show from Professor Wolf's perspective, uh, because like, so I, I do agree with Ethan about that, that, um, that like, I don't, like clearly these countries, I mean, putting aside the like super uninterested semantic debate about whether to say that they like, you know, weren't socialist or they were just a different kind of socialism than the kind, you know, socialism that, you know, that Wolf advocates, like whatever you want to say about what to call them. Right. It's, it's clearly has very little to do with what he's envisioning when he talks about socialism. So in some ways it's like a weird thing for him to take on. And it, and it kind of feels like a, like sort of assigning himself work that he doesn't really need to do to, to say what he's saying. But on the other hand, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think that it is almost certainly true that Soviet style economic planning. I mean, I think it, it has a lot of problems. It's bad at a lot of things, but I, I, I think it is like really, really good at like rapid industrial growth. I, I, I think that's like just, definitely true like that mm -hmm. um that pretty much all of those you know countries like had at least some initial period of crazy growth uh and and i think it, i think it kind of makes sense i think it's the flip side of like what's bad about that model since it's uh like you know it's probably not original to him but you know Bhaskar sankar and the socialist manifesto you know it's just where i remember it from he uh has this line about how the soviet version of economic planning was, you know, all thumbs and no fingers, meaning that it was really, really good at like rapidly churning out, you know, like zillions and zillions of tractors and tanks, uh, you know, and thank God for it, right? Or else the Nazis might've won World War II, but, uh, but like really bad at coordinating production with uh, like fine grain consumer needs. And, and it just, 
I don't know. It seems like both are probably true. I think that the China example actually might be more interesting because even though China is, it's, you know, in a weird way, even further in some ways, maybe from, from what uh, Wolf presumably wants uh, because it like, it's a society, society that has both massive economic inequality and massive political authoritarianism, mm-hmm. which are presumably, you know, the opposite of what his preferences would be in both cases. I think there's also a weird way in which China is maybe a more interesting example for him because if what he wants, and I think this is a little bit unclear in some of his formulations, but like if what he wants is sort of what a lot of people who advocate quote unquote market socialism sort of roughly have in mind, which is like state planning on the level of, you know, the commanding heights of the economy and then, like, I don't know, you know, a, a market sector of, of competing worker-owned firms or something, then in some ways, as much as normatively, it's really far from what we want because uh, it, it, it has tons of billionaires and tons of poverty and it's incredibly politically authoritarian and et cetera, you know, nationalistic and et cetera, et cetera. But despite all that, okay, I mean, structurally, they're not worker owned, of course, you know, uh, that they're just like structured like regular capitalist firms, but China is a market economy that has way more state economic planning at the high level, at the sort of commanding heights level than any normal capitalist economy does, certainly at least in peacetime. And it's been incredibly successful. So like that actually, you know, in a weird way, like that, that one feels like it might be more relevant to me. Yeah, um, I think even then, um, I agree with your assessment that it seems like Richard Wolf is kind of just giving himself more work mm-hmm. than he needs to do, right? Because mm-hmm. I mean, if if what you want is to to point to an example of a country that has you know super high amounts of of public ownership of you know large mm-hmm. sectors that we want to nationalize, um, I mean, there's a country in Europe for any sector you want to point to, you know. Um, mm-hmm. so I think all you really need to do is show that, um, I, and I think you've even worded it this way before is that like, we don't have to point to, uh, China and Russia. We can just show that all the things, all of the policies or institutions that make up the model of socialism we're advocating for, uh, have mm-hmm. been successfully beta tested under capitalist economies. Right. right? Yeah, no, I, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think, yeah, in Wolf's position, I think he'd be much better off just talking about, you know, like Sweden and Mondragon than than uh, than talking about China and the Soviet Union. I, I I think maybe it's kind of the flip side of the way that Wolf is very, you know, what did Victor call him earlier, right? A socialist bulldog that like he has mm-hmm. um he has this certain kind of style that's like halfway between a professor giving a thoughtful lecture and like an insult comedy act uh that yeah Yeah, he kind of reminds he's and he's got this like kind of i don't know if he's actually from new york or at least somewhere in the northeast but he's got that like that new york edge that kind of edginess that harshness uh so exactly which i guess insult comedians were of course historically like from from that area so and i think that's also what makes it satisfying if you have socialist sympathies to watch him because he does have this kind of like attitude um uh this kind of put down the attitude that that is that that is enjoyable to some extent but at the same time like it it did seem weird to to go down that road and i'm obviously more interested and i think all three of us are Uh, who are you know have have are are find a certain kind of socialism that has a lot of democratic legitimacy like what ga Cohn talks about and mm -hmm. and even what he talks about with regard to worker co-ops that's i think the target that we're probably interested in so you know hopefully the, the debate goes more in that direction yeah, I, I think that I think that because in some ways it might be a symptom of the fact that he's so good at that combination of things. Uh like I mean at, at some of this, like even when like I'm not totally sure why he's taking on the arguments he's taking on, I mean, whatever, it's fun to watch, right? You know, yeah. like like I think you could probably like replay it and like see me like sort of doing the like a very quiet version of what it was that gif, you know. With, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, <laughs> like at, at, uh, at some of these points, but also I think because he he is such a kind of um, 
you know, bare knuckle boxer about it. I think that he just doesn't want to concede anything. Hmm. And it's probably some of that's probably a mistake. It's like, well, I mean, why not just say like, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, that's not really very similar to the model that I'm, I'm advocating, you know, or let, let's, let's move on to, let's move on to what I do advocate. Right. Like, like, hmm. I think that would be, I think that would be totally fine because it's like, yeah, I mean, there were things, um, you know, there are things that the Soviet economy was good at. That's true. There were also things it was really bad at. And, and I don't, I just don't know why, like, it, it, it just seems like a weird rabbit hole to, to, to go down. Right. Like, like as the, I mean, I don't actually, I mean, I, I guess I've got just a little bit of, of what, of like, what might be leading Wolf in that direction. So like, I like, there is a little part of me that wants to fight about that just a little bit, like, you know, yeah. Oh, wait a second. Now we're going to say that there are other factors that might have to do with like what happened to the Soviet economy. Like when, you know, aren't the bad things about the Soviet, you know, Soviet economy is supposed to be a hundred percent due to the economic model. Like now, now successes or because of, you know, something that's unrelated to that. So I, I do want to fight about that a little bit, but I also mm. think that like objectively, that's probably a, a mistake to, to fight about, right? Because like ultimately, yeah. who, who cares whether the Soviet Union or Japan develop more quickly in the in the twentieth century? That has absolutely nothing to do with anything that Richard Wolff and Destiny probably actually like disagree about at the core of their economic worldviews. Yeah, exact, exactly. I think I. You know, when Destiny asked him, you know, uh, like, like, what do you mean by socialism? Right. And then he kind of went into these three examples. And I think that will become kind of a subject of the debate later, if I remember correctly. Like he kind of went into these this historical, almost like professor lecture mode, um, which isn't bad. But I think that you're exactly right, Ben, that that I think what would have been interesting and what probably Destiny wanted him was like, well, what what are you supporting? Right? Like, what right. is your what is like the socialism that you are actually want to argue for? And instead, he kind of went into this broader kind of like bringing the historical context and and all that stuff, which is interesting, but like not really, I think, what the meat of the disagreement, as you said, uh, is about. Uh, yeah, I, I I also I agree with um something that uh, Ben hit on in the, in the last point, which is that um, I like, I don't find the arguments. I mean, I personally, like, I agree that, um, uh, that the Soviet union's growth probably had something to do with, with how large it's in, involved its government was and, you know, industrializing and so on. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, I, I'm sort of, I feel like if, if I didn't already agree with that, I wouldn't really be persuaded unless you could give mm. some kind of like a mechanistic explanation of, of why that, that caused that growth. Um, but I also agree that like, even though I don't find that particular argument um, or the, how Wolf's presented it that um, persuasive, um, I also think that there's value in it. And I think maybe I'm misrepresenting Destiny here. I'm not sure. But I feel like Destiny kind of worded his original statement very strongly. And he said something like, whenever a country tries socialism, it leads to this really bad results. Uh, and then it seems like Richard Wolff gave an example of when, uh, you know, that didn't happen. And then Destiny's like, okay, well, we have to look at more factors. And it's like, well, yeah, we can do that more nuanced analysis. But once we're doing that, it's like, it seems like pretty clear that the original statement you made was a bit too strong. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's right. I think that, um, like, yeah, cause it's, is it like, it's a, I, in fact, actually, I think the better thing for destiny to have done at that point would be to say, okay, like, again, why not, why, like, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt anything to concede this, right? I mean, like, just, just say like, okay, yeah, in terms of industrialization, it, it actually, it actually does seem to be a pretty good model, but like, here are all the very real economic problems with it. And like that, that just would have been better than just like fighting about whether, you know, the example of Japan shows something. And by the way, I would not pretend to know very much about Japanese economic history, but just based on what I do know about other countries, I would be really curious about how free market that actually was. Right. Like, like I know a, a country that I do know a lot more about, um, you know, South Korea, where I lived for three years, like has, uh, I, it, uh, it is often like, you know, touted as one of the sort of, you know, 
whatever, right? Is it it's supposed to be one of the, you know, the four tigers or whatever, you know, that they uh, like as as this like free market success story and like the actual economic policies that that led to uh, the success of the South Korean economy were, you know, I mean, certainly not socialist, but also not what people usually mean when they say like economically liberal, right? Like that there there is like, you know, certainly at the very least was like massively protectionist uh to you know to like let local industries you know grow up because the like dictators who were running the country at the time were ignoring their western economic advisors and you know because they're pretty sure that you're not a real country until you make your own cars so again i don't i don't know anything about japanese economic history anybody who does feel free to correct me in the chat but uh but i so i'm not going to say that destiny's wrong about that but i am at least curious about about how how economically liberal Japan's economic policies were during those period of, you know, that period of, uh, of, of rapid growth, you know, cause like usually like, it's pretty rare to, you know, I don't know of any countries that have started out as, as, you know, undeveloped countries and, and be, and like joined the first world as a result of like super free trade mm -hmm. kinds of like laissez faire policies. So, you know, maybe Japan's the one exception, but you know, that would surprise me. All right, let's watch some more. So if you want to talk about the two and three definitions of socialism, that would be interesting to me. But I only heard two definitions of socialism here. Number one is just capitalism. Um, I, I don't know when this like redefining happened of taking capitalism plus government intervention I'll, I'll and you. calling it. Wait, 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 let me let me finish. Right. Okay. I, don't, I don't know why this was the case that uh, state intervention into private markets to have some form of regulation or some form of socialized healthcare or giving workers five weeks off became socialism. It is clearly not socialism. It's so not socialism that I think Marx himself even said that the state would be heavily required in maintaining capitalism, uh, more so than I guess even Marx was able to foresee because he predicted a, a revolution of the proletariat in his lifetime. Um, the idea that the state intervening and providing some sort of social welfare or safety net is, is that's just strictly a capitalist system with some government intervention. Um, if we want to talk about the concept of the government owning and operating enterprises, or number three, the idea is that the workers themselves have some like worker managed thing, um, I, I would be interested in, in discussing either of those two options, as I believe all five questions I laid out initially applied to them. But for number one, I just I wholly reject that as a form of capital as a form of socialism. If you believe it is, I'd be curious if you can tell me what is the difference between the the first thing you laid out and any capitalist that acknowledges that some level of government intervention is necessary in keeping the economy going. I'd be glad to explain it to you. The history of socialism gets going in the middle of the 19th century. And at that time, socialists began to argue that capitalism was over, capitalism was done, and, and a better system was available and should be pursued. And they had a whole bunch of ideas about that. They were a relatively small group. If you know the history of Marx and Marxism, it begins relatively small. As the 19th century progresses, it gets larger and larger. And guess what happens when that movement gets larger? Debates begin to happen inside of it as to what in the world capitalism is and what in the world socialism is. And here we go. Some of the people decided that socialism as a radically alternative system wasn't in the cards. Could never happen in some views, could only happen in a distant future. Well, what then did socialists do in the meanwhile before a real change of system happened? Answer, advocate for the government to be taken over by universal suffrage, the mass of people would institute a socialism that was, if you like, a step in that direction, an early socialism, if you like. And by the way, there were big debates, pro and con, within the socialist movement about this, but they settled to understand, let's call it one kind of socialism. And that's what you have in Western Europe, in Scandinavia, to this day. Socialist parties advocate that, and the people in that society uh, often vote those groups in power. I'll give you an example. The government in Portugal right now, a perfect example, European country. The government of Portugal is a coalition of three political parties. The largest is the Portuguese Socialist Party. The second one is the Portuguese Communist Party. And the third one is the Portuguese Green Party. They were elected as a coalition government in 2016. They were reelected last year. 
parenthetically, if your audience members don't know about this, that's because you live in a society that doesn't tell you about this, even though it's public knowledge to anyone interested in finding out. Those parties push a socialist agenda by which they mean government rules and regulations. You may not like to call it socialists, but the people involved and millions of them around the world do. The other kind of socialism broke away from this first kind in the aftermath of the Soviet revolution. They were in favor of taking that extra step. Socialism for them meant that the government should take over and operate enterprises, at least the industrial ones, maybe later the agricultural ones. And to do, underscore their distinction from the other socialists who just wanted government rules, regulations, and controls, they gave themselves the name communist. And that's the only difference between them. And it has been that way for the a century now since the Russian Revolution. <clears throat> and then there's this third one, which has to do with transforming the workplace. Those are all socialisms. They argue, they debate, they have a rich literature. We have lots of empirical examples of all three kinds in the world. And if people want to think about how they work and what kind of society they produce, there's loads of evidence there. You don't have to hypothesize or pretend or, or demise either, because really it doesn't lend itself to that if you're serious. Okay, first of all, just because a government calls itself socialist, I don't think that that's adequate to define said government as socialist. Do Good. you agree Give with another, that? Uh, fine, you can have another, that's what the this debate is, is about. So given that, what the hell was Venezuela doing in the open statement? But anyway, right. we don't yeah. need it. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking that, I mean, I find, you know, I think what, like, I, I'm, I was like remembering what the reaction to this debate was on, on the internet at the beginning and how, you know, I think there was a lot of people like who had more, much more leftist sympathies kind of thought that that Wolf really schooled destiny and watching this again, like I see why they thought that because he's kind of um, flexing his intellectual chops. He's, you know, he's, he goes in and he's, he's showing how much he knows the history of, of socialism and like all the ways in which we've been misinformed about those things and all that stuff is in a way satisfying if you're sympathetic, but I guess I found it ultimately, again, to go back to what we were talking about before, I feel like it's just, we're avoiding like what might be the fundamental and interesting disagreement between them about like what they're actually advocating. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that there's like, I kind of have, um, I guess, criticisms on both sides of this sort of exchange, which is to say that like, um, on Wolf's part, uh, I do think that he sort of overstates the extent to which these, you know, countries or people calling themselves socialists um, should mean that 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 classifies or, or that we should classify that as a kind of socialism. Because I mean, to, to, at some point, like, we're going to have to start engaging in some sort of uh, conceptual engineering or something like that, where we're just going to have to say, like, look, some people did use this word in that way. But if we allow the definition of the concept to include that, then maybe um, it'll sort of the concept that we're trying to define will sort of lose its distinctiveness uh, and its ability to contrast with the things we're trying to contrast it with. Um, but at the same time, um, if uh, Destiny agrees with me on that, which I take it that he does, um, you know, as you said, it's it's hard to see how he could bring up some of the countries he brought up uh, to, to argue against socialism. Yeah, I, I think it's a little, um, I think just on the basis of this debate, it might it'd be a little unclear what Richard Wolff is arguing for. If you watch his, his other work, it, it becomes very clear, right? You know, but like, I, I think I think just on the basis of this debate, it would be a little unclear what he's arguing for. Uh, because like Victor said, he's, you know, giving all these different things that socialism could mean. And, you know, he, he doesn't really, um, you know, he's he's not, like really honing in on uh, on the specific one he advocates, but I also think it's a little unclear, like what Destiny is taking himself to defend it when he talks about capitalism, right? Like, like what's the, um, um, like, because in his opening statement, right, like he was 
sort of scattering his fire all over the place. Like he was talking about socialized health care. Uh, he, uh, he was talking about abolishing the commodity form, right? He, uh, like, and, and a lot of stuff in between there, right? So, it, so it, it's, it does sort of seem like the range of stuff that Wolf is talking about here is roughly the range of stuff that Destiny was, was attacking in the, uh, in, in the opening. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I think it's like, I think that's really unclear on, on both sides to me. Uh, I guess I, I have mixed feelings about basically what they're arguing about right now, which is what the relationship is between social democracy and socialism. Um, is I do think it is important to distinguish between, you know, just talking about like socialist policies and talking about the kind of socialism that would come after capitalism. Uh, and, and that that is an important distinction. So, I, you know, I, mean, I guess I'm sort of with Desti on that, but like, also, I think this insistence that social democracy just has nothing to do with socialism <laughs> is like really overstated. Like, yeah, uh, I, I, I was also going to say, I think, well, one of one thought I have about that is just, you know, <laughs> immediately I was thinking how, you know, conservatives in America just call the, you know, the request for maybe some more um, universal access to health care immediately. That's socialism. So there's a complicated relationship about like what's defined uh, as socialism in what circumstances. But yeah, to say that it has nothing to do with it. But yeah, I mean, Ben, I agree with you also that on destinies and like he hasn't told us like neither of them has actually told us what they're advocating for. <laughs> like. Like, like they're just kind of arguing about these different things, but I have no, like, you, like if you're just watching this, you'd have no idea like what either of them's position actually is. And you have to kind of infer it. Right. I think a lot of people might infer that destiny is actually some kind of maybe, I mean, if they don't know him at all, he, who knows, right. He could be like a libertarian total, like free market, right, right wing capitalist and, 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 you know, and, and Wolf, it's like some kind of like Leninist, like who knows, right. It's just impossible to infer what, what actually their, their positions are right now. Yeah. I, I mean, I think one way that you could, I mean, I don't, whatever. I mean, like it's a, uh, I, I think that like arguing about what the word, like how best to use the word is like maybe the least interested argument you could have about this, but like, um, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to talk either way and just say like either that like the other stuff isn't socialism or it is socialism. It's a different kind than, than I want. It just depends how broadly one defines socialism. But I also think like, okay, if socialism means having a, uh, you know, that having an economic system that's, that's, that's different from what we've got now in some way that seems like it's, it's different on a, on a level that is as fundamental as, as, as what we have now is from feudalism, right. You know, that, that, that's, that seems like at the very least that's, that's gotta be, you know, I mean, if we're not talking about that, right. Then, then I'm not totally sure what we're talking about. Uh, then, okay. So I, I think some of that, I mean, unavoidably is just a normative question, right? Like, like, what do you think is, is wrong with what we have now and, and how do you, you know, and, and how do you propose to change it? And, and I think that, I think it is plausible to say, uh, I was, I was just arguing with, or, you know, whatever. I was talking about this with Kale Brooks on the Jacobin, like something they do on the Jacobin YouTube channel for like subscribers like uh, last week. And, and I'm, I'm going to now advocate what, like the position that Kale was taking in that discussion. I'm not totally sure what I think, you know, but like, I think that this is not unreasonable that think, okay, what's well, the thing that's most distinctive about capitalism is not that there are markets, uh, although, because, um, you know, obviously lots of societies have had markets, but it might be that people are dependent on markets in a different way under capitalism than they are under, under any other economic system. Uh, that, you know, if, if you're, you know, whatever, like if, if you're a feudal peasant or a feudal lord, right, either way, you know, you might you know, I probably do interact with some market mechanisms, but I mean, that's not the sort of core of how you support yourself. And so you might, if you think socialism has something to do with uh, creating a form of society in which people aren't dependent on markets in the same ways, or certainly not in the ways that we find most objectionable about, about capitalism, certainly the labor market, uh, then I don't know. It doesn't seem totally crazy to me to say that, like, look, I know that the standard move for for like you know liberals in the sense of like 
you know, usual American use of the word liberal. Like the standard use of like move for liberals is to say, you know, socialized medicine doesn't have anything to do with socialism, but like, I don't know. I mean, it seems like a major blow against, you know, market dependence, you know, <laughs> like that, that, that sounds, you know, that, that does sound to me like, I mean, yeah, obviously doing that is not in itself the same thing as having an overall socialist mode of production, but it doesn't seem crazy to me to say that, that has something to do with socialism. Yeah. And, and I mean, particularly in the case of, of socialized medicine, because it's not just that you're providing a service to make people less dependent on markets, but you're also nationalizing an industry. You're bringing it under like collective right. control. Mm -hmm. um, and that's so I, yeah, I disagree with um, like when destiny says that sort of the Nordic social democracies don't have anything to do with socialism. Well, I mean, insofar as socialism is about like, you know, in some vague sense, public control over the economy or over the means of production. It certainly seems like the Nordic social democracies have much higher levels of public ownership um, over the economy than uh, than the U.S. does. Um, mm -hmm. So that seems like it has something to do with with socialism. Uh, but yeah, but I also agree that um, that the fact that they're further in the direction of socialism, which is how I would characterize right. like the Nordic social democracies, that doesn't mean that they are socialism. I think it's it kind of, I think it's less useful to, to think about the, the words in that way. Yeah, that, that seems exactly right to me. All right. Uh, I, I stopped when I stopped because I, I got annoyed again about the Venezuela thing. So we, we, should, we should really keep watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, Let's just hold on one sec. Well, you... Yeah, okay. So you, we have to give a chance as well because you, Wait, well, you often question, have opportunities to give... Yeah, sure. uh, yeah. Right. I guess, like, my, would you consider, like, for instance, like the Nazi Party? Would you consider that a socialist party, as they have socialism in the name? It doesn't seem like a good. No, but the, why the not? Minute, the minute you know anything about the the Nazi Party, you'd understand that. That would you say that Portugal lives? Is Portugal a socialist economy, or do they have markets? Do they have private investment? Markets have nothing to do with socialism. Okay, can you tell me what is your definition of capitalism then? I, I just, because when I ask you what, what is socialism to you, I'm like, I understand that you can talk a lot and you can tell me what other people have considered socialism to be, but under your current definitions- No, I gave you my definition. Hold on, hold, no, 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 you haven't given me your definition. You've told me what other thinkers and what other countries in the past, your definition is not what Portugal does, it's not what the Portugal, Portuguese socialist or communist parties, you're giving me what other people or other thinkers have thought what socialism well, is. Oh, because you under, your current, under your current definition, number one, the Democratic Party in the United States would be considered a socialist party because they're in favor of heavy government intervention in terms of climate change or health care. And I don't know if you would agree, would you agree that the Democratic Party in the United States of America is a socialist party or if they no. rebranded themselves? Okay, so so it, it's clear then that the naming mechanism alone isn't enough for you because the Nazi party obviously called themselves socialists. I don't think many people, me included, would consider themselves socialists. And it's obvious that there must be some um, there must be some outside definition that you're alluding to that when you call something socialist. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what what is what can you tell me? What is capitalism to you? What does it mean when an economy or a society is a capitalist economy? What does that mean to you? Let me answer. I gave you three definitions of socialism. I told you they weren't the only three. This is a debate that's been going on inside socialism. And it's perfectly reasonable for me to give you those three. It might be nice for you if there was one you could cling to, but that's not the way it is. The tradition is too big, too broad, too global for there to be one definition, as there is in most interesting things in the world, and certainly in, and in many large organizations and large traditions. I give you my own. My own is focused on the transformation of the workplace. It's more interested in the micro transformation than in the the macro ones, and particularly skeptical about the power of the government as having had some bad consequences. I want to learn from these early efforts to build socialism so that the future revolts against capitalism will have a better outcome than the ones that we've already had. They what achieved is some, let me finish. They achieved many things we want to hold on to, and they made some mistakes we want to avoid. And that's exactly what it means to learn from the past. Now let me address the question of capitalism. Here's what capitalism is not distinguished by and therefore is not useful as a definition. Markets, slavery has markets. It's a different economic system. Feudalism had markets for much of its history. That's not a definition of capitalism that's unique. Capitalism doesn't uniquely have markets. 
at silly free or controlled markets, which is all we've ever had in the world, controlled kind, or as old as, as, as Plato and Aristotle, who argued over markets. By the way, both of them opposed markets and thought they were socially destructive institutions, just for the as, as a footnote you might be interested in. But capitalism is unique in one way. It's not a system that's unique in its markets. It's not a, a system that's unique in its quote unquote free enterprises. Those are as old as Methuselah. But here is what's unique. Earlier systems, for example, slavery, organized the production of goods and services around a dichotomy, a slave and a master. The master owned all the equipment, all the means of production, and including the worker himself and herself, he owned them. And that was a very unusual way of organizing things, but it existed for a long time. Did it have markets? Often. Did it sometimes exist without markets? You bet. Then there's feudalism, radically different. No master, no slave. Nobody's anybody else's property. But you know how that works? You have a small group of lords at the top and a mass of serfs at the bottom. And the way the system works is that the serfs swear loyalty to the lord and the lord in return to the serf. And the whole thing is sanctified in Europe by the Catholic Church. And then okay, can't wait for, for, let, can't... Let, let me finish. Then comes capitalism. It's not a master and a slave. It's not a lord and a serf. It's a completely different arrangement. It's a contract. It's an employer and an employee. They don't swear anything to one another and neither owns the other one, but they enter into a contract in which the employer says, I'm gonna give you a wage at the end of the week. You're gonna give me your brains and muscles for these hours of these days. And that's a deal we're going to make. And that's how we organize production. That's the distinction of capitalism. That's no, what I not. mean it's, by that's, capitalism. No, you haven't given me a definition of capitalism at all. You've told I, me a bunch of things that capitalism isn't, and then you've given me a bunch of random collected facts of history, but none of these not things- Not at all. Are, no, wait, no, hold, absolutely. For instance, when you talk about how markets aren't unique to capitalism, that's great. Worker management is unique to socialism. Worker management can exist under a capitalist system right well, now. I, I know that you like to talk about Mondragon. Let, 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 let Destiny finish. Let Destiny finish. We're going to go one at a time here, okay? So let, let Destiny finish and we'll continue. When we talk about work managed firms or worker managed co ops, these things exist under capitalism. What, what, what are you, okay, well, what are you saying then? Can, can I, hold on, real quick, I'm sorry. Can I get a, an explicit answer um, that? Sure. He's answered within the last 50 years without going back into feudalism or what the Pope said or the schism of the church. I just want to know very concretely without moralizing or loading anything or without talking about something that happened in 1850, what is capitalism to you? What just, can you just tell me or explain what capitalism is? Because sure. it sounds any, like, any, yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. Any definition of anything is a process of separating it from that which it is not. Okay, so I've got to say, uh, I do find this part a little frustrated because, um, because you know, you could I think fairly criticize Wolf earlier in the debate for you know for for not being um, you know for not being clear enough about uh, about what he what he's defending, but in this section, I actually think he's been. I mean, I think I think he's been a little bit uh, stubborn, like just now, just before we cut off, right? You know, like like instead of just restating what he said earlier, he was like, oh, you know, fuck you and your request for definitions, right? You know, but like, right up until then, I think Wolf was actually being extremely clear. Uh, and 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 I think uh, Destiny is sort of acting like he's still being, you know, he's still being unclear. And he's he's doing this weird, like, yeah, I mean, I, I think he just told you, right? That they, uh, that like, uh, that... You know, capitalism is a kind of class society where instead of the uh, it's instead of workers, uh, the you know laboring class being the uh, the property of uh, of the um, of the ruling class, or instead of having this like weird system of feudal rights and obligations, technically speaking, the laboring class and the the ruling class are you know entered into a contract whereby workers get a wage and you know and but like capitalists are in control. Of, of production. I mean, that, that seems, that seems completely clear. 
And uh, and I don't I don't know what's supposed to be wrong with that or what's supposed to be left out of that. And it actually seems like going back to feudalism and slavery is useful because he's uh, he, he's saying, look, I mean, this is the this is what it has in common with these systems. This is what's different about it. You want a definition? That's the definition. And and I also really hate this because like what the move that Jesse is making at the end is the exact thing that like libertarians always do in uh, debates about socialism. Where they say, oh, you want workers' control? Well, workers' control can exist under capitalism. It's like, yeah, okay, right? And, like, you can have pockets of capitalism within feudalism, right? Like, that that doesn't, that doesn't like, surely what we're talking about, we talk about an economic system is what predominant mode of production is, not, like, you know, like, are there, sure, I mean, you can have, like, you know, a predominantly capitalist economy that has some slavery in it. You know, you can you can have a predominantly feudal economy that you know that that has some islands of capitalism in it. You know, whatever. But like, what's the what's the most typical economic relationship in a in a system? I mean, that that just that just seems like the real the real question. And it's like, yeah, okay, sure, we've established that you could have under the rules of capitalism, you you could have a little bit of workers' control around the edges of the economy. But I don't know what that's supposed to tell you. So I think that there's, um, so I'm not sure exactly what Destiny meant with that comment. I think that there's, um, there, there's a way in which I could see bringing that up, like making right. sense. So, um, so if Richard Wolff's point was like, well, clearly we can't say that uh, capitalism is about markets because slavery and feudalism had markets. And if Destiny's point is just, well, sure, but... Um, just because they had those things doesn't mean they had them to the same extent, right? So maybe we mm -hmm. could say that slavery and feudalism had markets, but maybe commodity production wasn't as generalized as it is mm -hmm. uh, under capitalism now. And so maybe like bringing okay. up worker management under capitalism could be like a counterexample to the sort of approach that uh, Richard Wolff is uh, using. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, if that was his point, it wasn't clear to me, but that is actually a totally reasonable way that he could have brought it up in this case. I, I think that, um, yeah, may, maybe I'm just like post traumatically triggered because I've heard so many libertarians say in debates, you know, it's like, oh, you can have workers' control under capitalism, as if the issue were whether like workers' control is illegal under <laughs> yeah. capitalism, you know, rather than like, Yes, the that that is not the predominant relationship. But that's not a real option for most people most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so yeah, maybe maybe Destiny is not making that point at all. Maybe he's just making the point that like, and you know, I think this is also totally fair because like uh, the same like, I think that I think that Wolf is being ambiguous between the correct point that the existence of markets isn't distinctive to capitalism. And the much more dubious claim that like markets don't have anything to do with what makes capitalism distinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. I think that he's like, my impression is I think destiny does really want a, like a clear definition. He wants like a necessary and sufficient condition of like what uh, capitalism is. And I think he's like getting really frustrated by this more historical kind of like lecture style that Richard Wolff is giving. But I think you're right that he, I mean, he was being pretty clear and giving his definition, but, you know, again, I, I do find myself, um, you know, just, just, I want to talk more about, or I want to hear more about like um, the kind of arguments for both the, the kind of like normative preferability and like the, and like the, the, the tactic to how we're going to transform the workplace, the thing that Richard Wolff is, is advocating for. And instead we're kind of, stuck on this debate about uh you know what is capitalism what is socialism and i think it's true that uh you know one one feeling i had is you know cl clearly there there's if, if, if someone who knows more about the history if it was a debate about who has you know more knowledge about the history of socialism i mean it's it's no contest i think obviously like wolf is, is showing is his chops here big time but in terms of like what are the positions they're staking out again if it, we're, we're not really there yet Right. Um, and, and it's just kind of, you know, he asked for it for a definition of he wanted a specific answer right to the definition of, 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 of and he didn't get it. Instead, he got this pretty sophisticated kind of account of the transition from feudalism to kind of like the kind of steps that that took. And of course, and, and it's true that I think he's just like not really uh, like look reading between the lines that there is actually a definition that Wolf was providing there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think Wolf's view, I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure, right, is that 
um, you know, capitalism is a economic structure where the dominant uh, economic relationship is wage labor, um, like contractual wage labor and, and socialism or the kind of socialism he likes is an economic system where the, the dominant economic relationship is, is, uh, is, you know, workers controlled production. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Uh, it, it would be really interesting. And, you know, I, I just, I think that, and I think that that was reasonably clear in what he just said in the last few minutes, you know, before this point in the, in the debate. And I think maybe destiny is like getting frustrated enough at the, like right now that he's just not quite hearing that. And also it, it just doesn't help that the styles are just so different here that they have that like, I, yeah, I, I mean, like, like Wolf, um, you know, like Wolf approaches these things for the most part, right through like the like basically, yeah, this 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 kind of like this weird fun hybrid between like classroom lectures and um, and insult and, comedian, and, I think you said, and, yeah, yeah, insult comedy uh, and and Destiny, uh, you know, wants to like you know talk very fast and like use very precise definitions and all that stuff. And there, there are good things, and bad things about both of these methods of, uh, of communicating, but like the, the two together is hard not to be kind of a shit show because like, you know, neither of them is going to be operated in a wavelength that the other one really like responds to. Yeah. I mean, I think that they, they really clash. Uh, I think their personalities definitely seem to clash and, you know, I definitely enjoyed uh, Richard Wolf, <laughs> kind of, you know, they both have, I think both of them, they clash and they're really different, but to a certain extent, I think both of them are in the business of sort of like owning for lack of a better <laughs> word, you know, like Richard Wolf, I could tell the satisfaction he got when he was saying, you know, I know you'd like me to give you one definition that would be convenient <laughs> for you, but you know, that's not the way it is. Right. So clearly they both like to be kind of, uh, shit disturbers with their argumentative. They just do it in very different ways, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that it, seems right. It's it's very it's just very frustrating, I guess, to see like it it should be clear to both of them what Richard Wolf wants, right? And so they could just agree to disagree about what other things count as socialism and just say, okay, the thing you want, let's argue about that. Yes. But you know, the yes. fact that they haven't like gone on that path is is I guess just very disappointing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, that seems right. I mean, I, I have like yeah, and it's a weird thing um, because I don't know, um, you know, if if I ever found myself in a position where I was like debate or wolf something, I had no idea how it would go. Uh, if if I, um, I do know exactly how it would go to uh, to debate destiny about something. Uh, and it's uh, it's also, I mean, in, in a different way. There's a. Um, you know, there's a clash there because like stylistically, like I, I think I'm, I'm very, I'm like much more inclined, I mean, like whatever, I'll like get irritated and all that stuff. But like, I'm, I'm much more inclined to just sort of like be like, let's, let's be, you know, let's be very chill about this. And, you know, and, and like focus on, on the, you know, and like focus on the arguments themselves uh and and maybe trying to try to like build a certain kind of narrative over the over the course of the debate like you know the you know charlie kurt calls himself a populist but like he's just a regonite or whatever right you know uh which is which is i think a very different thing from uh definitely what either of these guys do in their own ways and like maybe even maybe even more different actually from like what most leftists do in debates which is just kind of try to um you know, try to get people who already like them to slow clap, you know, because, because they had such like a devastating burn. Right. I mean, like that's the, uh, that's the overwhelmingly dominant leftist mm. approach to debates. That's what I've never seen much point to. Indeed. All right. Let's go. That's all any definition ever was, but we don't typically How do, you do define... definitions by naming let every single okay, let, let him, let him answer. Let him answer. A dog is you differentiated from a cat. Otherwise, there's no way to do it to differentiate and to give a definition of capitalism. Is you that have true to about dogs and cats? It from that which it is not. Those other systems didn't use an employer-employee relationship. 
That is the core distinguishing quality of capitalism. Slavery doesn't have that. Feudalism doesn't have that. And I never use the phrase worker management. Managers are not what we're talking about. Owning and operating. If you want a user word, it's workers as their own boss, workers as their own board of directors. If you like, you can use the colloquialism in the United States that has existed throughout our history. A worker co-op, a cooperative, one worker, one vote, all decisions, majority vote. That doesn't exist in capitalism. That exists in a different relationship among the people at the workplace. Not slavery, not feudalism, and not employer-employee, because those are different people in each of those systems. Worker co-op, that's no longer the case. That's why it's a radically different socialist system, unlike any of the others. How can you say that that's unlike any of the others when co-ops can exist today under capitalist economies? Slavery can exist and did in our You're not country. answering my question. I'm not, I don't want to, I want to show you the negative or of everything I'm saying. I'm just, you're saying today that this There's is a no unique problem. thing that exists. There's never been a problem in any society of which we have historical record for different class structures, different systems to coexist. You're asking me a question as if it were, we, is this possible? It's never been anything other than the norm. But you're telling me that in your society, or I could be wrong, you can correct me, but it sounds like in your your society, you would exclusively like firms to be in the hands of workers, which would necessarily- Not at all. I've never written that. I've never said it. You're just attributing things to me. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying trying, trying very hard to understand what you're saying, but the problem is your answers are very long-winded. You're not really answering my question. So am I to understand then that you are in favor of a society where workers have the option to vote on and have control over the workplace, but there's also room for private investment and the government intervenes in things like healthcare or education? Is this like the type of society you're aiming for? My guess would be that the transition from capitalism to what I'm talking about would have long periods of time, typically, where these different class structures, these different systems coexist with one another. A. That's what we have today. B. No, you, you don't have it in anything like the way I want it. Well, how do you want it? What's different from your vision than what we have today? Well, what we have today is predominantly capitalist with smatterings of the other. I'm interested in having predominantly socialist with smatterings of the other. And That's without, the difference. And without disallowing private investment or disallowing well, individual owners, how do you get there? Private investment is a completely different matter. You can have private investment and worker co-ops. How? It exists. What's the problem? Why would you why would I ever? Why would I ever invest in a company without gaining some amount of equity in the company? They have no obligation to return to me any profit. I would never invest in a co-op. Why would you invest in you, you invest in, in businesses in the United States? Correct. Because for businesses- example, let me finish. Hoping, for example, for something called a capital gain. Mm-hmm. You hope that if you buy the shares and if the company does real well, you will be able to sell the shares at some future point to another investor at a higher price. Correct. If that company's growth is the product of its worker co-op organization, you're perfectly happy if you can make an investment that grows over time. But in your world, you, those I shares don't exist. Example. First and of all, those... there exist where uh, these kinds of enterprises exist in the world. So this is not a hypothetical. Then they're not, then they're not worker co-ops by sure definition. They are. A worker, co- okay, tell me, I, my definition might be incorrect, so you can correct me. My understanding is that what makes something a worker co-op or what makes something employee-owned is that the means of production or whatever firm you operate at is wholly owned and operated by the workers, meaning that when profits are generated by that company, they're returned to the workers, and when decisions are made about that company, those decisions are made by the workers. If that is the definition that we're going by, there is no room for private investment there. Right, but that's the wrong definition and not okay. the one that operates in the world. Give me your definition. The definition of a worker co-op is that the workers make the key decisions. They are their own board of directors. They may make the decision democratically to raise capital for their business by selling shares. Of course they could do that. Those shares would not allow the people who own them to do the steps that they can in capitalism, 
They would not, for example, be able to dictate who's the board of directors because the workers themselves are their own board of directors. But there's no problem with private investment. There never was. And my question is, most, why, the first, example, well, no, no, I don't need an example. Successful. No example. We, we, have the, we have this definition. Okay? I just want to hone in on this definition. Okay? My question is, is, why would any individual ever invest in a company that doesn't have a fiduciary responsibility to their investors? So, for instance, in your world, if I were to buy 20% of a co-op, their workers tomorrow could say, you know what? We're all bored. We don't want to do this anymore. We're going to move on. We're shutting the business down. And now I've just completely lost out on my investment because they have no responsibility to me because I have non-controlling shares. If the only shares you're selling are non-controlling. Why would any private investment ever come in knowing that that co-op never has an obligation to make a profit or return a dividend to the investors? There's many companies listed on the stock exchange right now that pay no dividends to their investors here in the United States. It's a normal part no, of our stock. No, market. absolutely not. They might not pay. What are you pay talking about? You, the, I'm talking about capital markets 101. They might not pay a dividend, then but they are, then you're badly misinformed. I, am most, not, I promise you, the foundation of the stock market in the United States is a returning of capital to the people that are the ones doing the investment in companies. Now, it might be the case, as you correctly point all. out, it might it, absolutely. It might no, be the case. Really, really, yeah, really. Unaware. You're, you're, most you're, of you're, the you're, most <laughs> of the most dynamic companies in this country are selling stock to people to whom they have no responsibility, legal or otherwise, to give them a dividend ever. Okay, Professor, do you believe that a dividend is the only way that you can return capital to shareholders? That's not the point. That absolutely the, is the point. You made No, you made the point, what is the company responsible for? The company is responsible to run the company. They are not responsible to give money back, whether it's dividend, return of capital, or any other way to the people who give them the money to buy shares. It the people who give them the money are gambling. They hope that they can sell the shares for more, and they will sell the shares to anybody who can buy them. The company is not responsible to buy those shares. The company is not responsible for what price they can get. If they lose their shirt, tough luck. It's not an obligation or a responsible. That's the way the law of this country works for the stock market. And there's no problem in a worker co-op saying to investors, we're going to grow better than what you can get from a capitalist enterprise. So buying a share of our stock will give you a better shot to sell it at a higher price later. And I can give you examples. I'm Wait, I, don't, do I don't want examples. No, 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 no. We don't need examples. I'm going to give you an example of a company that did that, just so you can see why an investor would do it. I mean, really, you can make the theater of your hand in, on your face. I'm not making the problem is you're just you said something that's just so on its face, absurdly incorrect about the characterization of U.S. capital markets. You, do you not agree that there exists a legally binding the SEC literally regulates fiduciary responsibilities to investors? I don't like this trick you've pulled. Let me finish. Please oh, let wrong. me finish. You, let me finish. Let me finish. You've made it sound as though I believe the only way to return capital to shareholders is through dividends. That's absolutely not the case. That's oh, one reading of it. You can return it via stock buybacks. You can return it uh, via right. increase. But you're not obligated to do any of that. You're you have, not obligated you have to do a any fiduciary of that. responsibility to your shareholders. Of course if you, you do. If you read, if you take my advice, I teach these courses. If you read what fiduciary responsibility means, it's an abstract generalization. It can be easily demonstrated in thousands of legal cases that there is no obligation of any material sort that they return money to the people who invest in them. It is perfectly okay to run your business as you think it should best be done, short of uh, committing fraud or illegal activity, and that would apply in any system. The investor is taking a chance, buying your shares in the hopes of selling them at a higher price. It happens all the time, and it would be perfectly consistent with workers who run their own enterprises and are their own board of directors. That's not a problem, never was. There's nothing inconsistent with private investment on the one hand and worker co-ops on the other. Now, if you have a worker co-op system, they might decide, because we have democracy now, that they don't want that, that they would like to be the owners as well as the board of directors of their own enterprise. That's possible. 
That would be one of the variations of worker co-op economic systems, just like we have variations of capitalist systems. Early Can I ask you, is, so in, in a private business in the United States, if I invest my money in a business, a publicly traded business, if they were to cash out all of that money, just close the business down and run, you're telling me that in the United States, that company wouldn't be held liable for scamming its investors? Absolutely. If that company had a good lawyer and showed that they made an honest effort to have a business and then it didn't work out and they closed it down, the investor would have absolute wow. standing. Exactly. You're right. But you, you used a word there, an honest effort, and it's doing all the heavy lifting in that statement. Of course, you absolutely must show a court that you are making a good, this is part of your fiduciary responsibility. You are making a good faith effort to yeah, that's return money. To that's what the worker co-ops could easily do. We're making a good faith, honest effort to make a business. And that business requires us to do X, Y, and Z. And the private yes. investor got nothing to do. That happens every day in the United States. That's not what a worker co-op's maximizing for, though. A worker co-op, if by your definition, which is a democratically voted uh, organization, okay. is going to be trying to take into account what their members are voting for. They might not vote in the best interest of a shareholder. They might vote to no, do something completely different. That would different be understood the by the shareholder. But then, but that's by my the way, only, only the most naive shareholder in the United States believes that the company's decisions are intended to do the best for the shareholder. I can show you 50,000 legal cases in which that's not the case and which it, it is contested in the courts. And you could have that in a in a worker co-op. That's great. And I can show too. you the and I can show you the Dow Jones, the Nasdaq, and the S P five hundred. We could go to the UK and look at the FTSE two fifty, the FTSE one. And I can show you histories of markets where companies do reliably over long periods of time return profits, whether in the form of dividends or the increase in your share price, to people that invest in those companies. I'm sure you can show me a lot of things that happen that are bad in capital markets where companies uh, scam people much as I can show you bad things that happen like famines under the USSR. But pointing out to a few bad actors does not clear up the problem of the fact that investing but we're in not a talking about we're not workers talking have no about, obligation to return no, no, we're not talking about investment. bad actors you're inventing these things we were talking about private investment and worker co-ops you had made a statement that these somehow couldn't coexist i'm explaining to you that there's not the slightest problem you want to change the topic that's very nice but that's what the topic was we weren't comparing goods and bad stories we were explaining how and why private investment is not an either or in relationship to worker co-ops the one of the fastest growing industries in spain is something called the mondragon cooperative corporation it's a family of worker co-ops it is now the seventh. Worker it's, managed, it's, though. Right? I don't know. Finish. This isn't even a good. It is. It is. It is the seventh largest corporation in Spain. It it's started a federation six, of corporations. Excuse me. It's, it's a, a federation, federation of corporations. corporations, and it's not even worker managed. It, That's just worker owned, called, and they have all the same exploitative problems. They go to South America for labor. They rely on contract labor. Chomsky's criticized the Mondragon thing for existing in a capitalist framework. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh. I have no idea what destiny means when he says that Mondragon isn't worker managed. I mean, like, like, is he just saying it's not a direct democracy? Cause I don't, I don't, I think that would, I mean, sure. Right. But I, I don't, I don't think that there's anything that Wolf said that suggested that it would, you know, that like every single decision has to be made by like a committee of the whole. I mean, like it is absolutely true that Mondragon's top decision-making bodies are elected by the workers. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what he's getting at here. Um, and I also think that I feel like for the last, like, maybe I just, like, wasn't, like, tracking well enough. But, like, I feel like for the last, like, 10 to 15 minutes of this debate, it's just been, like, like, it seems like Richard Wolf, like, Destiny is arguing that... Um, uh, private investors wouldn't be as incentivized to invest in worker co-ops as um, uh, as traditional firms. And Richard Wolf is arguing that there's nothing incompatible between, uh, you know, having dominant worker co-ops and having private investment. But I feel like those two positions aren't really in tension, right? Like I could easily mm -hmm. say, uh, yeah, private investors won't invest as much in co-ops, and that's why we need, you know, public banks giving preferential loans or uh, right. tax credit incentives. So I'm just not seeing like the tension between their their different positions here. 
Yeah, to be fair, I think that I think the Destiny actually started out saying that if there was private investment, it wouldn't be a co-op. Mm. And then and then, but I think he like very quickly and without really signaling it, switched to just like private investors would have less incentive uh, to uh, to invest in co-ops, which um, you know, which I think he's basically right about, right? Which 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 is which is one reason, by the way, that I think I'd probably actually go further than Wolfwood in the direction of saying that like. You know, you need to have like nationalized financing, you know, for to to have like a, a co op dominated system. But, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you that like the core things that they're both arguing for are compatible with each other. It's also weird, though. I've got to say, um, like, it's a very frustrating argument because it's a little unclear what the positions are on both sides. But it's also like, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to do the like technocratic like expertise worshiping thing too much here but like i mean i think if i were like doing a debate with an economics professor i wouldn't like just i wouldn't just assume that like he he didn't understand like the base like basic mechanics of how stock markets work mm. yeah for sure i mean i think there is you know some good questions that got posed uh, earlier in the section we just watched that didn't really get picked up. And I think both of you kind of touched on them, which is, you know, I think destiny at one point asked, okay, so like, would you disallow uh, yeah. like non co-op? And I think that's a good question. Like, and yeah. I think, and, 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 you know, Ethan was just saying, well, there's a lot of things that we could do to incentivize them, right? There's policies that right. we could bring in to like incentivize co-ops. But I think like, that's a key question, right? Like if you're going to, if you're going to defend an account of, of market socialism, that, that like, somehow has co-ops i mean it, it's to me like the core question is like okay well how are we going to bring this about what kind of incentives are there going to be are you going to disallow companies like corporations that don't do that so that was interesting and i wish uh that they they dwelled on that um, yeah to be, a little to be bit fair more. to be fair wolf did answer it but only very very briefly right he said uh uh like like he said that the difference between what he advocates what exists is that now we have capitalism with a smattering of worker co-ops and 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 he wants a you know mm. he wants the other way around like a predominantly worker controlled company that would like have a smattering of capitalism around the edges but he also didn't say anything about what's transition of that would yeah like, exactly which is a huge question and and i i think i think all the questions you're raising right now are legitimate i mean my my, my own um like uh i mean i think i would probably you know i think i would probably be most friendly to just saying that like you know there's probably like certain kinds of cutoffs right like because it would be crazy to say that like i think it would be i think it would be a crazy rule that like you know you have like absolutely like like in any kind of market like I mean, whatever again. If it's the if it's like the communism of the twenty third century, and there's just like you know, like no money anymore, or whatever. That's different. But like, if you're talking about a kind of market socialist system, it'd be crazy to say like absolutely no wage labor at all, right? Like, like if you you can't, um, you know, like if you have a podcast, which you know, don't get me wrong, I hope podcasts would wither away after the revolution. <laughs> but uh, you know, if you do for some, you know, if you do still have a podcast, uh, and you like um and you know let's say the revolution happens soon so you're so you're still hiring j andrew world to do your graphic designs for you right like le like if he's doing like a few hours a week of graphic designs for you as he does for several podcasts you know under capitalism uh then um then i don't think that mean like i think it would be a little much to say that therefore like he needs to have voting rights within every single one of those organizations right like that that would be i think a, a crazy Matt, like like i i i think that would you know that would be unreasonable but you could maybe say like any you know if you have a company where you know more than some very small number of people you know work you know more than a certain number of hours a week you know that they have a that uh that like they have and you know and they've done it for more than a certain amount of time or something like that right you know that they have to have uh, that they do have to have voted rights within the company, like like something like that wouldn't be unreasonable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 very imperfect because you know, like any system like that creates the possibility of loopholes and whatever. That probably wouldn't get it done by itself, but like to think that that's part of the sort of mechanisms that you had to enforce that being the kind of the like dominant economic relationship within that society. I think that's pretty defensible. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I And, you know, you said a bunch of interesting things about how it could work, and it's just a shame that they didn't come up, right? In the day. <laughs> like, like, like the fact that literally, you know, it came up, he just said, well, I want a society where it's more predominantly the worker co-ops. But, you know, it, there's a bunch of interesting things, I guess, the point that could have been said um, that just like weren't weren't really explored. Um, you know, also on the question about this, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, my, I'm a scholar of political theory. I don't know that much about economics, but so I, and I don't know that this question about the fiduciary responsibility and all this stuff. Yeah. And then what, what are co-ops maximizing for? Like, I just don't actually know. I, I, I would defer to Richard Wolf being an economics professor here who, you know, who went to Yale and I've heard right. him talk about how one of his colleagues was, I think Janet Yellen, right. The fed chair or was the fed chair at least. Yeah. So, you know, I, I trust him to know, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if either of you know more about this, but I, you know, I don't know what the extent to which the fiduciary responsibility is enforceable, is real, um, or, or if it even matters. Yeah. I mean, I think this is just a weird thing where they're sort of talking past each, like, or, or maybe they weren't talking past each other, but it was a little unclear to me, at least what destiny's claim was. So it's also unclear to me whether what Richard Wolf was saying, like really engaged with it. Um, Cause it seems like, because I think there are really two issues here, right? Like one is whether you could have co-ops selling some sort of like non-voting shares or bonds or something like that, right? Like, which, which sure, right? I mean, you, you can, you know, uh, you could have all those things consistent with, you know, with not giving like actual like, um, like voting ownership shares to people outside, which is the thing that would like make it, you know, to the extent that you did that, that would make it not a co-op. Uh, but it's also, okay, so fair enough, you could do that, but then Destiny's claim, I think as well, okay, but like, you know, that wouldn't be as nearly as appealing to investors as, as like having like regular voting shares of the capitalist corporation. And I think I'm with Ethan on this. I think that like that just seems like I I don't to the extent that's what Destiny is saying, I mean I think I think Wolf could and should just grant it, right? You know, say like, yeah, right? Like it wouldn't be, right? Which is and 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 you know, I, I think that it and also also by the way, I think that like even from a perspective of like socialist values even if you, even if they are like non-voting shares or bonds or whatever, like, like it's, it's not clear that that's a great thing to have as a big part of your, your financing mechanism, because uh, it, it's still, you know, even though it's technically compatible with, with having, you know, worker ownership or, you know, worker, you know, com or at least, you know, a hundred percent worker self-management, like it still means that like a lot of the surplus created by the firm is being distributed not really as a direct result of democratic decision making within the firm, but like really just based on like who could afford to to buy non-voting shares or you know take out bonds or whatever. Like so so that seems like a not great thing from a socialist perspective. Uh and and it's also I don't know. It's it's uh it's a weird argument because I think Wolf hasn't said that much about how his model would work. I mean I guess that's mm -hmm. your point, Victor. Um and and I think it does get down to like somebody in the in the chat brought up a, an article Sam Gendon wrote in Jacobin a few years ago criticizing Wolf and and other people who are sort of co-op enthusiasts for like not sufficiently um, kind of grappling with the contradictions of of co-ops operating within like basically capitalist economic structures and. Um, you know, I, I think it's fine to say you can have like, I mean, it, it is even my position, right? That you know that you you're like any realistic form of socialism we could have anytime soon would still have some market mechanisms in it. I think that's I think that's absolutely right. But like also, yeah, I mean that that would be very different from the way that markets work right now. And 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 there are these hard questions about what the mechanics would be and how the transition would work and. I agree with you, Victor. Those are super interesting questions they're not getting into. I, I guess I guess in defense of Wolf, I think that what he's really arguing here again, I think it's tricky because it's a little unclear what Destiny's claim was. Because even though I agree with Ethan that like Destiny's core claim, or at least the second version of his core claim, is like true, right? That that worker co-ops 
like non-voted shares of worker co-ops would be less attractive to private investors than voted shares in regular capitalist corporations. I think that's true, but also I think Destiny's reason, like his stated reason for it, I think was a little weird and unclear because his stated reason for it was like, oh, the workers could just like decide to not uh, to not like return on the investment or something. And it's like, well, I mean, only if you change the laws specifically to allow that, but like, why, why would you do that? Right. I mean, mm-hmm. like that they, and, and I, and sure, I mean, the workers could decide and like, it seemed like at one point destiny was saying, well, the workers could just democratically decide to like close up shop. It's like, yeah, sure. Right. And like, so could, and like Wolf's, if, if Wolf's response seems like pretty definitive there. Yeah. It's like, okay, sure. So could like, you know, so could the board of directors of a, of a corporation, right. I mean, what, what's the difference? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and what they'd have to prove in court would be the same thing, right. You know, that they made an honest go of it. So they, and I think it's, I think like destiny's drive to have some sort of gotcha moment of like Wolf, like misrepresenting how markets work or something and Wolf's, uh, drive to like, you know, not concede anything and like show this punk kid what's what, right. Like, are like really like clashing here in a way where they like the combination of the two means that the argument isn't really advancing. Cause it's like, you know, like you could, like this could all just be so fast, you know, like, like it, it could just be, it could just be like, yeah, well, uh, if the market, if the laws are the same way that they are right now, you know, that the workers couldn't do that. Uh, and, and I all, and it would be really good. Like I would have really liked him, like something that Wolf doesn't do here that I would have really liked him to do is to just pause and say, hold on. What do you mean? That's not what people are maximizing for. What do you think that people are maximizing mm-hmm. for in a co-op? Cause that's something that like, Economists who study worker co-ops actually disagree about, right? Whether worker-owned forms, you know, are um, are actually like uh, motivated to to maximize like individual returns per worker as opposed to the overall revenues of the company. You know, like that's a that's a common claim, but I mean, I think it's a um, I think it's a controversial one. Like the guy, what's his name, uh, governing. A uh, guy who wrote Governing the Firm, the Labor Managed Firm. I am uh, blanking on his name right now. Uh, but uh, it's, yeah, Gregory Dow, right? Like, I, th- I, I think as somebody who's like studying co ops a lot, he disputes that. But like, whatever, they could argue about that. That would be super interesting, right? Right now, you know, right now, the whole, the whole argument is just kind of like, you know, destiny trying to catch him, not knowing how the stock market works, and you know, and 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 uh, and 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 Wolf, you know, and like Wolf kind of being like, you know, having fun uh, batting yeah, him around about more. it, but like in a way that doesn't really advance the argument. Exactly. Yeah, and I think also on the note of um of like the the investment stuff, um, I mean, we talked about um Matt Brunig a couple times earlier, but you know, one of his cornerstone uh trademark ideas is that you know we could just have um something like a government-owned investment fund and invest in companies that way and then have the revenues that accrue to it be redistributed to the population uh as a whole right and so i think like there's a variety of ways to sort of like because it just feels like destiny's core point is like um there's some like uh, capitalists will be less incentivized to invest in uh, worker co-ops. Therefore, it seems like in some way we'd have to problematically disallow investment in order to have a co-op dominated economy. And it seems like Richard Wolf is responding by saying like, well, no, what's the problem with private investors wanting to invest in a mm-hmm. co-op? Um, but I think like the more promising alternative response is just to say, sure, maybe there is some tension, but there are just alternative things we could do such that we still have investment in some form and dominant co-op uh, mode of, of organization, I guess. Yeah, something I will say I've always been a little unclear about about the, the Matt Brunick stuff is the extent to which he's talking about how he wants socialism to work and the extent to which he's talking about like how to transition to uh, to, to socialism, right? So, So in other words, like, is he imagining a form of market socialism where like the end goal is a society where like they're like stock ownership still exists that like, that there are still people like buying and selling, you know, like regular voting shares of corporations, but the government just like owns most of the, like the, the like lion's share of the stock and like the biggest corporations 
or is he imagining that like the government buying up stock is like a method of transitioning to like some other way of running companies? I don't know if you have a sense of that. So my sense generally is that um, his like, so I've, I've never heard him talk about um, some idea that he has beyond, um, you know, just uh, the sort of society where like, um, basically the main difference from what we have now is that the vast majority of capital is is owned by like the, the social wealth funder or something like that. Um, and yeah. I do think that that sort of leaves, but he also, um, I've also heard him mention that that sort of covers the public ownership side. Like we can have traditional uh, go general government services like the post office and then socially owned enterprises in the traditional sense. And then in places where we want public ownership, but also markets, we can just have a market that's dominantly owned by the social wealth fund. Um, and now I think what that sort of leaves open is the sort of uh, presumably as socialists, we want some sort of worker involvement or worker control. Uh, and I and I have heard him mention in, in some articles in passing that in addition to the public ownership side, we should also have, you know, large sectoral unions and like co-determination policies and uh, those sorts of things. Um, so, I, so I generally take it that that's like his, um, that's his broad proposal, I guess. Fair enough. Uh, well, I want to see him debate Destiny about it, but it's, uh, <laughs> I think they were supposed to a while back. Oh, were they? But it never happened. Yeah, interesting. It'd be cool to see. Yeah, no, actually, that would be really interesting because I also I think that um, my sense is that in certain ways, Matt would be a better stylistic fit. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Yeah. More clever. And even if this was your go-to killer example, the Mondragon Federation of Co-ops exists under a capitalist framework. Could I finish, or do you need to tell me about the Mondragon Corporation? I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt your lecture. I'm sorry. Continue. Sure you did. Come on. <laughs> Who you think you're kidding? The Mondragon Corporation has many parts. The biggest single part of it are a collection of worker co-ops. If this were the United States, we'd call it a holding company, which is a collection of subsidiaries that do a variety of things. It's very common in the United States, and it's very common in the world of worker co-ops to do that as well. The different divisions help each other. The co-ops support one another. That's how the Mondragon Corporation went from six people in 1956 to over 100,000 now. Most of the people in the Mondragon Corporation function within their members, about 200 companies, each of which has workers, one person, one vote, making democratic decisions. This company has been extraordinarily successful. It has outcompeted its capitalist uh, competitors. That's how it became so large. That's how it becomes so successful as it has been. It has rules. It maximizes, because you raised that before, a variety of objectives. It is not focused exclusively on profits. The notion that profit is the bottom line is the very convenient economic nonsense because profits go into the hands of the capitalists at the top. And of course they want the company to maximize profits because that's what they get. They don't maximize wages because that's what they don't get. Other people get that. If the other people ran the business, its objectives would not just be profit, but the well-being of those workers, the community's well-being, a whole lot of other objectives to maximize. And you'd have to choose among them. You wouldn't have the essential profit maximizing, which we teach in economics without it explaining to our students that by maximizing profit, the whole company's life is devoted to maximizing the return of a very small number of people within it, okay? This is what has changed in a worker co-op. That's why it's so different from capitalism. It's decisions, investment, growth, distribution of income, all the big decisions would be made with a different set of objectives because a different set of people with different interests are making those decisions. For a society like ours, that blabbers on about democracy, you'd think this was the most attractive possible way to proceed because it democratizes the economy by democratizing the enterprises at the core of that uh, economy. Instead, we live in a society 
which pretends that you can have political democracy, even though in economics you have an autocracy, a tiny aristocracy running each enterprise, doing what it wants, maximizing the part of the output it gets, namely the profit, and therefore we get surprised that our political democracy doesn't work real well. Hello, that's because it's trying to sit on top of an economic system that is the opposite of democratic. The proposal of socialists is a proposal to extend democracy from the political realm to the economic realm. Why that is frightening to people who otherwise say they favor democracy, I find amazing. I find it equally amazing that throughout this entire monologue, you're, all you're advocating for are liberal markets with a little bit more government intervention. If you Mondragon. want to talk about Mondrag, absolutely. If you want to talk about Mondrag, and we can talk about Mondrag until we're both blue in the face. One, it's not worker managed, okay? It is just worker owned. A lot of the management that comes within a lot of the Mondragon Federation come from other workers, but they do not vote on all of their policies or productions. That is absolutely not true. Number two, Mondragon does run itself for profit. That's why if you only change the means of production and not the mode of production, you are still producing commodities for a profit now it happens in this case okay i just want to pause to ask if either of you guys have any idea what destiny means by mode of production because it's the same it's the second time he said uh he's like differentiated mode of production from means of production where he seems to be talking about ownership of the means of production mm -hmm. and he's contrasted it to something called mode of production but i have like you know i know what marx means by mode of production which would be stuff like who owns the means of production. I have no clue what destiny means right now when he uses this phrase. So I think, and, and I agree with you, like, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's sort of weird to use the terminology. Cause I mean, like, I mean, mode of production kind of is like Marx's terminology, but I mean, I just take it that like, uh, under like Marxism, the mode of production just is something like, um, I guess if you want to be super precise and, and go with like, you know, how Cohen wants to cash it out, it's going to be something like the relations of like effective power over the means of production or, or something like that. Um, so it's not exactly clear to me either what mode of production is supposed to mean. But I think if I were to guess, I think he's going to say that uh, the means of production is like who owns the means of production. And then the mode of production is like, are we doing like planning or are we doing like generalized commodity production or like, uh, you know, how are we distributing the stuff that we, the means of production create? That that would be my, my guess. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's also, I think Destiny is also using the word co-op in a weird way here because like he, uh, he seems to be denying that Mondragon is a co-op, uh, which is weird because he wants to simultaneously say that uh that richard wolf isn't uh is describing a form of socialism he's just describing liberal capitalism even when wolf says he wants a predominantly co-op economy mm -hmm. uh and that uh that oh co-ops exist under capitalism so what are we even talking about but at the same time i it seems like it seems like destiny is just defining co-op as a company in which um all decisions are are made by all you know like by a vote of every single worker at every moment and they're not interested in like maximizing the revenue of the company and, and those and those just like that just seems like okay i mean if that's what we mean by co-op and some of these are probably good criticisms but like i don't i don't think that's what anybody normally means by co-op i mean i think by co-op people normally just mean like a you know, a, a company that is, you know, that that's that's run by the workers, you know, like like which either directly or in, you know, like in the same way that like when we talk about democracy, we don't 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 normally describe like limit that to like little towns in New England that still make most decisions by you know by town meetings, like you know, like we normally include like you know cities that have elected city councils. Yeah. Oh, sorry, God. Well, I was just gonna say. Um... I was, I mean, I don't know how much either of you know about this, about like Mondragon specifically, but I think I saw someone in the chat earlier talking about how, I guess there are a lot of criticisms mm -hmm. of Mondragon that like, you know, I think they're like, what I've heard is 
there's like a core group maybe of companies that like really do get like the benefits, but then they end up kind of relying for that to be possible on like a bunch of other like subcontracted companies that like that do kind of get exploited. Um, and, and in a way, like a lot of some people argue that like that core group depends on the exploitation of the others. I don't know that much about it, though, to be honest. That's just like an outline of what I've heard. Yeah, I well, mean, I, th I, I think it is true that Mondragon has like, um, like, like Mondragon does like use subcontractors that are internally that aren't co-ops, right? That that are just they're just like regular regular capitalist companies that like that subcontract, you know, to it. So, which is like, you know, I, I think maybe goes to Gindan's point, right? That this is like, you know, because Mondragon is operating within like an overall capitalist system, so they have all kinds of incentives to do things that violate their own principles. You know, use use subcontractors who aren't, you know whose like employees aren't going to be members of the co-op and, you know, stuff like that. But at the same time, I think it is still true that like, you know, the vast majority of people who directly or indirectly work for Mondragon, like are actually worker owners of Mondragon. Right. Yeah. And I think that, so, I mean, Destiny brought up um, Noam Chomsky earlier, right? Uh, and he said like Noam Chomsky has criticisms of, of Mondragon. And, I, and that's true. Like Noam Chomsky does have uh, criticisms of Mondragon. But I mean, Noam Chomsky also says that like, despite these criticisms, it's still, you know, very telling that there is a business that's so worker involved that nonetheless has been so successful. So there still is like valuable lessons that we can draw from that. But it seems like it feels like Destiny is like making these points as if it sort of like takes Mondragon off the chessboard when it's like, but you're the person you mentioned, like Noam Chomsky clearly shows that, you know, you can have that sort of a more nuanced view about this. That's not just like Mondragon is my ideal version of a co-op, but also the fact that it has some flaws doesn't mean that we can't like draw valuable lessons from it. Right. I mean, it's a similar thing with like a, with like the Nordics, like people will say the Nordics aren't fully socialist and it's like, well, I agree, but like we can still draw lessons from the fact that they're in that direction and seem to be pretty successful. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. All right, let's get back to it. Case that the profit is going to the workers, but it still absolutely runs for a profit. That's why socialists point to it and say, look at how successful it is. Part of the reason why it's successful is the amazing revenues and profits that it returns to its workers that are generated. And then number three, um, Mondragon, just, in order just, to wait, continue wait, just let him finish, growing, let him finish, then we'll... in order to continue growing, one of the problems that Mondragon has started to face recently, and it's one of the reasons why it's criticized by people like Chomsky, is because it's had to continue to acquire more and more workers that do not get controlling shares, that don't have the ability to monitor what's going on. Mondragon also trades across markets, including going to places like South America and trading with exploited workers. So I don't think that Mondrag and finally Mondragon exists under a capitalist mode of economics. Like Mondragon exists and interacts with other people within a capitalist economy, which I think is good. If Mondragon works and succeeds, that's awesome. I think it's cool. I like to see all alternative types of businesses succeed, but I don't understand how you can talk about the successes of Mondragon and then say that like, well, this is an example of the failures of capitalism when Mondragon exists and thrives right now under a capitalist framework interacting with so many other capitalist sections of the economy and so many other capitalist countries in the world. My problem is that by moving more towards what you want, you would use government policy to necessarily disallow the types of private ownership or private investment that have been so important with uh, other types of yeah, you're just making, around the world. You're just making this you can stuff, keep you but, can keep saying okay. that I'm I'm making stuff yeah. up, but at the end of the day the, the problem Let that me we're explain. having you don't keep the, the problem we're having is I, I, the, the definition of socialism, and I, and I noticed that this is like the, it seems to be a key problem with people that call themselves socialists is your definition of socialism is so amorphous and morphing at any particular point in time. I, I still don't really well, you have seem to be having trouble with it, but that doesn't make it amorphous. It absolutely is amorphous. Even your oh, definition is. of capitalism is absolutely amorphous um, where I, I hear no, you're just not familiar with. It. That's I'm absolutely familiar with it. I, like, I, I absolutely <laughs> am able to, if you would like to ask me for my definitions of any of these things, I would be glad to explain it. And you can tell me, you can correct me, Professor, if you think I'm incorrect in my understanding of things. But I believe that w when I ask you to, to tell me, like, what is capitalism, what is socialism, and it feels like I'm I'm listening to Trebek, you know, read off the board in Jeopardy, I feel like that's damaging to the position that you're trying to explain more so than me asking the question. Yeah, well, let me correct you about Mondragon, uh, which is, by the way, how it's pronounced. Mondragon has multiple parts. Some of the parts are the adjustments it's made to living in a capitalist world. That's absolutely correct. That would have to be any worker.
oh, up there where it forms now, now or has in. Hmm. We uh, have some lag there. Yeah, I think there's a little lag going on here. Let me, uh, let me try something. as the biggest event in the history oh no okay uh where we were lost we? our place, eh? <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I think we were less than halfway or maybe about halfway or am i mistaken i don't know you would have seen no, it we, were than halfway. we were definitely at least like an hour in oh, okay good yeah Let's see. chat tell me where we were <laughs> uh let's see That experience. Russia was an experiment. Oh, it's probably you're, you're cutting industries that grew up in feudalism. Capitalism, what is socialism? And it feels like I'm I'm listening to Trebek, you know, read off the board in Jeopardy. I feel like that's damaging to the position that you're trying to explain more so than me asking the question. Yeah, well, let me correct you about Mondragon, uh, which is by the way how it's pronounced. Mondragon has multiple parts. Some of the parts are the adjustments it's made to living in a capitalist world. That's absolutely correct. That would have to be any worker. Okay, I think this is actually just in the original video. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Forms now, now or has in. Oh, we're losing Wait, the connection. Can you hear me? Uh, Richard, you're, you're cutting out. Industries that grew up in feudalism. Oh, sorry. sorry. Do, do, do you mind repeating that last line? You just cut out there for one second. Mm -hmm. Right. Any worker co-op that forms now has to exist within a framework of a society that's organized differently. That's exactly the way it was when capitalism emerged out of feudalism. The early capitalist enterprises, towns, villages had to exist within a feudal framework. They had to come to terms with that. Some of them were able to do it. Others of them disappeared or were overthrown by feudalism until they got big enough and strong enough and learned from the mistakes of early experiments in capitalism how to set up a system that would be what it now is, the global system. I expect the socialists to kind of replicate that experience. Russia was an experiment. China's a better better one, Cuba, Vietnam, and so on. They make efforts. They're learning what you do, what you don't do, what you replicate, what you avoid, and they will get eventually to the scale and sense of how to do it on a more global scale. That's how feudalism happened. That's how slavery happened. That's how capitalism happened. And it's reasonable to expect that's how socialism will happen. There is no simple definition of socialism that would be, to use your words, correct. No agency gives you out a license. This is correct. That one isn't. A tradition as lively, as global as socialism is always going to have different interpretations, different definitions that argue with one another. That's healthy. That's normal. There's nothing fuzzy or amorphous about it. The idea that you can have one definition is an authoritarian, authoritative and authoritarian notion that there isn't debate and contestation when there always is. My job was to give you three of the major definitions of socialism that contest in the world today that are widely accepted by everybody, of course. But those are the ones that are around, and it's reasonable to talk about the tradition in that way. Mondragon I mean, I is, let me finish, Mondragon is an experiment, a very successful one. You can, if you like, attribute everything to capitalism that happens that's good, and attribute everything bad that happens to the absence of capitalism. I'm not this doing that. I've never done that. And that's really not very interesting. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get into that. I will tell you that's that good. there are that's some remarkable job. things that Mondragon has done. Along the way, the majority of its workers voted the following rule. 
the best paid person in Mondragon cannot get more than eight to nine times what the least best paid person is. This was in channel. So this, I've been there. I've been there, I've okay. watched it, I've looked it's at just it. Not true. No. So you're telling me that of all the employees true. in Mondragon, the highest paid that was employee. A, that, was a decision, that was a decision made by a large number mm -hmm. of the worker co-ops that make that kind of so decision. So you're telling me that the highest paid employee in Mondragon it has a ratio many, of what many of the Let me finish. In many of the component co-ops, because you'd okay. say That's holding correct. companies. Yes. It's a holding company of many, many co-ops. In many, many of those co-ops, I can't speak for everyone, mm -hmm. this was a common rule. I went and spoke with them. I interrogated them about it. And that's what I discovered. They asked the rule after much debate that a maximum difference of eight to one. You mm -hmm. know that corporate CEOs in this country get roughly on average 300 times what the lowest paid worker or even the average worker in their uh, employee class mm -hmm. gets. What is the so ratio? They were, able, the ratio? Finish, they were able to do something about inequality. Wow, here they are, successful in growing. They're the seventh biggest corporation. They're the envy of most other corporations in Europe who cannot show such a history. But they were concerned not just to maximize profit, but to do something like limit the inequality that otherwise is so corrosive to societies like ours. And they were able to do that. That's an interesting quality. Thomas Piketty released a book in 2014 in which he demonstrates in 600 pages that every single capitalism we have a record of has built into it a tendency to ever greater inequality that is only periodically interrupted the revolts from below, like what we had in the 1930s in this country, which never are durable because once the, the revolt passes, the tendency of capitalism to inequality grows. That has always been an inspiration to socialists to advocate for a system that might have within it a built-in mechanism to at least reduce the inequality that that you know, haunts capitalism. And the reality is that Mondragon, and not only that, have demonstrated that there is a quality of worker co-ops that does and effectively a good job of addressing the inequality that otherwise haunts capitalism. And that would be an interesting way to understand why socialists would be drawn. They are not worker managed. The way a corporation works is there are three layers roughly. The employees who do most of the work, the managers who supervise the employees, and then another group of people to whom we give the name directors, the board of directors. The shareholders elect the board of directors because they're the ones who receive legally the profits and they decide what is to be produced, how it's to be produced, what technology to use, where the production happens, and what is done with the profits. The managers don't do that. So okay. the talk about gentlemen, gentlemen we're, coming up to, we're coming up to the hour now. Um, we have had uh, a disproportionate amount of talking time, I think, uh, by you, Professor Wolf. Well, at the same time, uh, Destiny, would you want to give a closing statement to this as, as we're coming up? I'll, I'll give you a couple minutes to respond. And then we, we got, um, we got I mean, into I the audience Q&A. Sure, yeah. I, mean, I just, I, uh, man, there's so many things. I, I just think it's incredibly disingenuous to open with Mondragon has 80,000 employees and they voted to have an eight to one pay between owners and, and, their, and their, or not owners, the highest not paid owners. employee and the lowest paid employee. But that's not true. You corrected yourself after I corrected you, which I'm grateful for. It's within, mm -hmm. within the co-ops, within that federation. I'm willing to bet that's that right. if I were to ask you, you probably couldn't tell me what the highest paid employee within the Mondragon Federation is. What is the ratio of their pay to the lowest paid employee of the Mondragon Federation? 
because it has an incredible vertical structure in terms of how it interacts with itself. Now, I could just as easily construct you a world where the ratio of pay between the CEO of Amazon or Walmart is much is is much smaller, where the ratio uh, closes between their lowest paid employee. If I create a Walmart or Amazon holding company and I simply split off all the managerial people or some sectors of that company into their own individual companies and break it up like that, the way that Mondragon has. Not to no, say that Mondragon, Mondragon is failed, not, do that. not to say that Mon they have totally different sectors. They have, they have, I'm not making this stuff up. Everybody absolutely. can go and look at how the company is structured. Everybody can go and look at the different absolutely they have this part up. stores. Um, got all right, all right. What, what are the times? Yes, right. they do not separate out their managers. They do not separate out one group of workers with high pay from others. That's a hustle. That will be a hustle. It, 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 You're it would be a hustle. about Mondragon. Is just, that's make-believe. You know. Do, I you guess acknowledge the that the your argument is so difficult that you have to make up the information to support it. Too bad. My argument is so concrete that I don't think I've had to bring up feudalism a single time to make any of my points oh, or ask you yeah, any questions. That would make, that would make your analysis a little um, richer than I, it is. So something 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 I'm I'm curious about. <laughs> Would you, why wouldn't you consider, just going by the incredibly generous definition you give me on point one of socialism, why wouldn't you consider the Democratic Party in the United States a socialist party? As a party that wants to see more um, more stuff returned to Americans, wants to see people with a greater control of the workplace, um, had members that were pushing for 20% ownership in the share of companies, Bernie Sanders and AOC, why wouldn't you consider the Democratic Party in the United States a socialist party? Because it opposes almost everything you just mentioned. It has a small wing now that is in favor of it, who, by the way, call themselves socialists. Mm -hmm. But the establishment of the Democratic Party, its history over the last hundred years since uh, Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, that's not fair. Why would, we, why would we talk about the history of it? Because, because history is always present. With Absolutely us. not relevant. You, you Absolutely said yourself. That the, Absolutely. No, you said yourself that the Joseph way that we look at Biden socialism is, today is Joseph different than Biden, it was 100 years ago. Joseph Biden is a product of that history, as he himself says. That party has been unable to make a government. They couldn't even preserve the level of government intervention that was achieved in the 1930s. The last 70 years have been a rollback of the New Deal, an undoing of it. And that was done as much by the Democratic Party as the Republicans. They, the Republicans pushed harder. The Democrats could not only not advance on what was achieved in the 1930s, they couldn't even preserve it. That's why we have an unemployment problem now and have had a terrible experience. I and think we have an unemployment. Let, no, absolutely not. not. A single an major unemployment problem. politician proposed a jobs program of the federal government. They worked so well in the 1930s. You couldn't even have the courage to come up with, with what was already done. It's been a retreat, the Democratic Party has been, a retreat from what it did before. All that AOC and, and, and Bernie are trying to do is to bring back the little bit of socialism that the last 75 years of the Democratic Party have been devoted to getting rid of. That's why they're so embarrassed, these political centrists, by the rise of the left. They thought it was over. They no, had pronounced the is, death of socialism. This is an unimaginable so analysis unhappy. of political parties today in the United States. I don't think the closed shop policies that Biden are advocating for represent some walk back in policies. Or I don't think that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party push equally or even remotely similarly for the types of economies that they'd like to see today. Um, whether or not you're from the Democratic Party day. functions, I don't know if your issues are with the Democratic Party or with the politicians that Americans elect. I know that it's a very popular pastime among lefties to demonize the Democratic Party for not being able to authoritarianly or totalitarianly rule the country uh, absent, you know, the other half of Congress. It seems like a lot of people uh, on the left don't seem to understand how our government functions. I don't know if that includes you or not. Um, well, but, we, yeah, the, we're, we're I, I lucky, think though. Given, we, given, have, we have folks like you that will help us. Uh, I, yeah, I guess we'll see. Yeah, all right. Well, um, why don't we move I, I on mean, to the I, questions? I, all I learned, the thing that I've learned the most today, I'm happy to see that the Democratic Party under definition one of socialism, I guess, is considered uh, at least somewhat of a socialist part of you as they are oh, uh, believers of enterprise I and private capitalists. And I guess, I, yeah. I just spoke against that. How you got out of that. I told you I, the well, Democratic I, you started Party to, was you, not. You started to, you started to appeal of government you started to appeal to things the democratic party all right, all right to, everybody or, or we're, we're all just yelling history 100 years we, back we've, like, turned, uh, okay. we've turned into a fox news channel let's let's slow it down we're going to get right to the audience yeah, q a okay
All right, so we yeah. have uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to all of them. I'm going to try and time uh, both of your responses to about two minutes. So I'll give you like a 10 to 15 second warning when you're coming up to that. Um, so the first one is going to you, Destiny. What could convince you uh, that you... All right. Um, <laughs> I've got to say that was really bad, right? Like... Yeah. I, I don't... I mean, it's it's one thing if he wanted to push, if he wanted to push and say that like Wolf was still being too vague about you know the why under the social democratic system, you know definition of socialism, uh, the the Democrats don't count. I don't really think that would be true, but like I mean, I I think that wouldn't be, you know like I I could see how he could continue to argue that, but like it seems like you know Wolf like gave like. It's like, no, I, I don't think that the Democratic Party is a social democratic party because look at its trajectory, you know, since the uh, since the New Deal. And uh, Wolf's response was to start going on about how the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are different, which nothing Wolf had said suggested that they weren't different. And that like leftists think that the Democratic Party could authoritarianly or totalitarianly, uh, you know, like like just you know make its will be done, you know, without without Republicans having to be involved. And I I just don't know. I mean, I guess the idea there is that oh, really the Democrats have these like super social democratic you know policy preferences, but they just don't have the power to carry them out. But like, it, it just you know I, I mean that would be. Um, you know, maybe that's like a, a charitable reading of what Destiny was saying there, but like overall, it just didn't seem like it engaged with what Wolf was saying. Yeah, it didn't really make much sense to me. It seemed like there could have been opportunity to redirect the conversation to something a little bit, but then I feel like uh, Richard Wolf was making some good points, and then it seemed like Destiny was trying to like die on the hill of like disagreeing with some kind of like points i mean it's, it's like i think you like came in in the middle of it and were like he's wrong about that right there's just like a bunch of points that i i think and, and instead it, like i was like i've been saying i feel like this whole time i just wished uh they could have actually gotten to some more like substantive point of like talking about their actual positions on what they want uh, and had a conversation about that and i don't think we ever really got there um. hmm. yeah i will say i think oh sorry uh, no please my internet's getting out a little bit, so I don't know if I'm coming in clear. Nope, you go. Um, I will say, in defense of um, one of the points that Destiny was making about the the relevance of of the history, right? Mm. Um, I could see making an argument about. Um, so if I say, well, it seems like under your definition of socialism, it's so broad that I could include the Democratic Party, um, and then Richard Wolf responds by you know talking about the history of the of the Democratic Party and how. They've done all these very non-progressive things in the past. Um, it feels like you could make a reasonable uh, a response to that by just saying like, well, OK, well, the fact that this single par party can oscillate so quickly between being obviously right wing on the one hand and seemingly almost cl being classified under your definition uh, of socialism, on the other hand, that just speaks to your definition being overly vague. Um, I could see that being like a, a reasonable point. Yeah, I mean, I guess it just it just seems like if uh, if Destiny's core claim is if you're like, because you could rephrase this entire thing, like, because it's I'm like it seems like Destiny is sort of making this weird like very unclear to be a combination of two points. One is it's not reasonable to call social democracy a form of socialism. And then the other one is, um, well, why isn't the democratic party, you know, count as, as like an instance of a social democratic party. And like the first one is a much better point than the second one, right? Like that they, that you can just say, yeah, sure. Like, uh, you know, social democracy, right. Where we're using that to mean like, you know, socialist policies, but ones that happen within capitalism, is a very different thing from socialism, meaning like a, a different economic system that would come after capitalism. Fair enough. Completely correct. And I, I actually think that would be like a reasonable, I think there's a reasonable criticism there of some of the way that, that uh, Wolf put it. But then saying like, 
is the United, is the Democratic Party the United States a social democratic party? Of course it's not. I mean, mm. like Wolf is just obviously right about that, that they have that like, yeah, there's a social democratic win of the Democratic Party, but it's like relatively powerless within the Democratic Party as a whole. Like, so it, it just seems like if the, like, is the Democratic Party similar to, you know, the kinds of labor or socialist parties that, uh, that, that Wolf is talking about that had these, uh, that were, were trying to, you know, uh, that are, are trying to reform capitalism in the kinds of ways that he's talking about, it seems like no, and the, the history is going to be like very relevant, um, you know, like, like at that point, like I understand destiny's point when he doesn't like Wolf talking about feudalism and all that. I actually, you know, I actually think Wolf wasn't saying that much about feudalism and that what he was <laughs> saying was like obvious, like was like pretty obviously relevant to what he was saying about capitalism. Uh, but like, I can understand that because, because destiny just wants like definitions that, that aren't, um, you know, instead of like talking about how different historical forms have related to each other or whatever, he just wants like necessary and sufficient conditions or whatever. I can sympathize with that. I mean, like, like that's, that's my, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was trained to have that pathology too, but like <laughs> I, I can, um, but like then, like, if you're going to say, what is the political coloration? Like, like what's the, um, like what's the political valence of the democratic party? then I don't know. I mean, like it, it really seems like what the history of the democratic party is, is going to be very relevant to that because it's like, yeah, does the democratic party like want to have, you know, support positive reforms to a greater extent than the Republican party does? Sure. Right. But like, if you're going to say is the overall trajectory of this party politically social democratic, then like that, it seems like bringing in the history and saying like, okay, here's what, like, here's the, the ways that, you know, like, Sure, there's like a moment maybe in the 30s when and you're like, you know, we could even say like from the 30s to the 60s, maybe, although really not continuously at all, right? Like, you know, there's kind of a moment with FDR and a moment with LBJ where, you know, the Democratic Party is doing things that are like a very modest version of European social democracy. But like in the several decades since then, no, I mean, that's that's not, you know, like, like it, it's like it, it has like really trended pretty hard away from that. And then maybe like come back like a little bit since then, but like a lot of that's in response to that, you know, so social democratic like wing that it has now, which actually does as we'll call points out, call itself socialist. So I don't know. I, mm. I, I'm going to like, I agree with all of your criticisms, like all of you guys' criticisms of like the overall way that the debate has gone that like, that like the thing that would be most interested and the most directly relevant to their main difference like, how do you think that the economic system should work is the thing that's gotten like the least airtime <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> of exactly. all the topics that they've talked about. <laughs> like, yeah, mm. totally. It's disappointing in that sense. I think, you know, on the point of, of destiny's, you know, his desire for kind of like necessary, sufficient, you know, conditions, clear definitions. I mean, I've, I've seen him debate before and I know that he just has this way of like, trying to get his interlocutor to just like agree with a definition like like this really like tight so he that's always his tactic he's like okay like let's like tell me exactly what you think and put it in a box and then i can like try to deconstruct it but then i think you know wolf is coming with like a pretty sophisticated analysis of like the history of you know capitalism socialism and he's just not willing to do that and i think uh in that in that sense destiny was just like super out of his depth because he just like wasn't it wasn't able to fit the mold of just like what he does of like what he wanted to happen um and then yeah of course you know it's just and then the the outcome was just the thing with just as you said ben where the most interesting question just didn't really get any of the airtime so yeah i i will say i think that um on the note of uh the democratic party being um uh, uh social democratic or not i i think i agree almost entirely with um with what ben said uh, in that I, I, I agree that um, the Democratic Party wouldn't, uh, as it currently exists and what based on what it's currently doing, would not meet uh, any reasonable definition for like a, a social democratic party. Um, but to be fair to Destiny, I would also say that I think Richard Wolf probably wasn't clear enough in mm -hmm. like saying that that's what he meant. Like that's because when he uh, was sort of giving his, his first definition of socialism, he kind of just said in very broad terms, well, we want to like 
deal with the externalities of capitalism and deal with inequality to some extent. And so I can see why Destiny would get the impression like, okay, well, I mean, if that's how vague your definition is, then it seems like it wouldn't be entirely unreasonable. Like clearly Biden to some degree wants to enact policies that decrease uh, inequality mm. and so on. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that mm. this is where what, what Victor is talking about really comes like really gets in the way of, of a fruitful exchange because um, because Professor Wolf is definitely um, like he's he's describing like sort of general historical trend lines, and so if you're hearing him in that way, it's clear what he's gesturing towards when he gives that like first definition of socialism. That like yeah, he's basically saying social democracy, right? Like that's what he's getting at. Uh, but if you're interested in hearing necessary and sufficient conditions that's like yeah i mean like if those are supposed to be necessary and sufficient conditions they're terrible necessary and sufficient conditions destiny is right about that but like also i don't i don't think that's what wolf was trying to do i mean i think i think i think wolf was just sort of generally trying to indicate like you know debates about reform and revolution you know within the socialist movement Mm -hmm. yeah i also think that I, I made an observation too earlier on that I think part of this, the way, like part of this is also, I think Destiny made just like a mistake with the way, he, with the question he asked of Professor Wolf. So he, like, if you, I remember, I, I noticed at the time that he didn't say, you know, what is the account of socialism that you support? He said, okay, well, what's the definition of socialism? Right. And then, Professor Wolf got into his professor mode and was like, okay, well, there's three, there's many different ways that we could think about socialism. And I think like maybe that might have been just like a key turning point because he didn't he didn't actually ask like, OK, give me your like the view that you're defending. He just and then he even did it again when it, capitalism came up. He said, OK, well, what, what's the definition of capitalism? What's like like so he yeah. didn't he didn't ask for like a narrowing of like, what is your take? What is your view that you're defending in this debate today? You know? Yeah, although I actually do think Wolf gave a pretty clear definition of capitalism. But, oh, yeah. uh, you know, like that was like only one. But yes, I, I completely agree that like. Instead of like saying like, oh, you know, you're giving an amorphous definition or whatever, it would have been a much better response if he'd just been like, okay, fair enough. Let me rephrase my question, right? What kind of socialism do you want? Yeah, exactly. All right. Let's see if we could skip ahead to um, some the, of the uh, Q&A. Yeah. I was going to say, if well, let's see how much we have left here. Let's move you. All right, so there is a little bit less than half an hour left to the debate as a whole. I, and so I think they said after the Q&A, they come back for closing statements, right? Yeah, I right. think so, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, guess I mean, my... You guys. What's up? I said it's up to you, so if you want to just skip to like closing statements, we could do that as well. But Okay. Uh, here's compromise suggestion. Let's... Uh, Let's skip ahead to where it's like um, the whole video is 142.03. I assume that the closing statements aren't any longer than the opening statements. So that's probably like the last six minutes. So we could, why don't we watch like the last 10 or 15 minutes? We'll get some of the Q&A. All right. The, sure. uh, yeah. I mean, if, I, if, I, if my memory serves me, I feel like the, the closing statements are probably like going to be the least interesting and more yeah. like the exchange that happens during the, the Q&A. But yeah, that seems like a good a good compromise. All right, let's do it. Yeah, usually we skip the Q&A entirely, but you know, but but if it's fun, like let's 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 get like a little bit of it. Yeah. The movements and so on beginning the construction, the slow construction of alternatives, they're going to we build a stable sustainable economy based on the bottom up democratic I think that you would have an easier time blaming Chernobyl on socialism than you would the coronavirus response on capitalism. That's all I'm saying. Exactly. That's exactly what you're saying. I see that. <laughs> okay. Uh, can we, uh, two more questions, gentlemen? Uh, do we have time for that? Is that all right? Got all the time in the world. Okay. Uh, to Professor Wolf, worker cooperatives survive and thrive all over the world by the thousands. Why couldn't we build a stable, sustainable economy based on the bottom up democratically run cooperatives, emulate that model here in the US? Why hasn't it taken it off yet? Or sorry, why hasn't it taken off yet? Well, there are many reasons. You know, capitalism, and I will apologize in advance for re- referring to feudalism and other systems, they not only take a long time to get going and to settle in. But when they do, one of the reasons they succeed is that they develop 
a culture, a politics that is consistent with, that is built so it reinforces the economic system upon which it sits. Capitalism is no different. If you begin to break down, as capitalism is now doing, and you see efforts, whether they're worker co-ops, socialist movements, uh, labor movements, and so on, beginning the construction, the slow construction of alternatives, they're going to encounter politics and culture that stand in the way, politics and culture that militate against it. I can't tell you the number of times I explain worker co-ops to people who really can't get their heads at first around, well, gee, how do they get money or how do they solve their problems or how do they grow? Because in their world, there has to be a boss and the boss has to be, in other words, they have adjusted their own life expectations and understanding of how the world works to the way it is now. All of that is breaking down, but it takes time. And I think that's why the you'll see that while w worker co-ops have existed from the beginning, when the United States was even just a colony, why it takes a long time before the combination of breakdown of capitalism and the emergence of these alternatives gets up to speed so that people's political and cultural awarenesses allow them to flourish. All right. Final question to you, Destiny. Uh, why do you never mention Vietnam, especially in relationship to uh, how they handled COVID uh, and their success in that area? Um, I don't know specifically why. I looked into, um, for all of my COVID debates, it was usually uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, South Korea, um, and then on the flip side, places like the United States and the, the UK, for examples of successfully handling the pandemic versus unsuccessfully handling it. Um, in terms of, uh, that, that's for the coronavirus stuff. In terms of like economic history, my understanding is that Vietnam tried the, you know, their single party state, labor unions can only exist under one party. They had a heavily socialized economy, but much like what existed in the USSR, people after their, you know, work shifts would have to spend time throughout the day um, engaging with like a shadow economy or kind of a black economy or a black market where they would have to buy and sell the goods that weren't otherwise available in their country. Um, and the, in Russia, they did this with a system, or in the USSR, they did this with a system of blots. Um, I don't know if they've got a formal name for it in the Vietnamese economy, but it seems like the way that Vietnam has worked to kind of modernize their economy through, I think they're called the, I, I'm going to butcher the uh, pronunciation, it's like the Doi Moi reforms, um, through all of these referendums they did in terms of bringing their economy more in line with being more successful, um, these have all involved the liberalization of their economy, the association with other economies around the world. And you could even see with some multilateral trade agreements like the TPP, um, outside pressure was actually forcing Vietnam to modernize on some of its labor rights. The socialist party of that country was not able to do it on its own. It needed some external association. And we can see that within countries, even socialist countries, that they still have massive problems with some of their uh, populations. I mean, we can point to the Uyghur situation that exists in China as an example of what is supposedly a socialist country having a huge problem dealing with uh, you, you know, uh, equitable shares of how to treat people within its own borders. All right, final question to you, uh, Professor Wolf. Uh, under your system of worker cooperatives, would I still get my PlayStation 5? <laughs> Absolutely, you'd have to struggle a little bit for it. You'd have to talk to your fellow workers. You'd have to talk about the distribution of income. You'd have to compare your desire for PlayStation uh, against all the other other interests of all the other people. It wouldn't be something you worked out on your own with your particular boss uh, in any way. It would have to be a democratic decision. You'd have to come to terms uh, with that the way you do with democratic uh, decisions uh, now in our society to the extent uh, that we have them. Uh, and I would like to add only that if if Steve is interested, he could also look at the experience with COVID uh, that the Cubans had, because it is in many ways even better than the ones that the Vietnamese had. Uh, for the uh, purposes of complete transparency, I'm just going to state that that last question was actually my own. And now uh, we'll move on to closing statements. Uh, we'll begin uh, with uh, Destiny, and then we will end with Richard Wolf. Uh, you have three minutes. Oh, geez, I didn't write a closing statement. Um, <clears throat> So I, I, at the end of this, I guess 
my important takeaway for all of this is I think that it is crucial not to moralize our economic systems. I think that when you start to moralize economic systems, what you forget is that an economic system is merely a tool. Um, I, I don't want to ask a question of like, is a hammer good or evil? I want to ask, you know, like, what, what is the best type of nail that you can hit with a particular hammer? When you begin to point out whether or not a particular economic system is in and of itself good or evil, then you lose sight of what economies are supposed to do, which is efficiently allocate capital or natural resources in ways that make a country as prosperous as possible. I do agree with Richard Wolf and probably with every socialist or every left-leaning person around the world that there are a ton of problems that exist in the Western world and more specifically in the United States today relating to things like inequality, social justice, a lack of access to things like healthcare or education or basic things like food stamps or shelter or um, <clears throat> or other like basic necessities. I just don't see how a socialist society solves literally any of these things. And I don't feel like I've ever been given an adequate explanation by any socialist for how they would organize their society. Um, usually these arguments are incredibly amorphous or vague such that literally everything is socialism. Like you can still have private enterprise and co-ops and the government does some things and voila, that's socialism, which just sounds like liberalism to me with government intervention, which is liberalism. Um, or they try to make arguments for more strict forms of socialism. Uh, but I think that it's hard to get them to admit that in those stricter forms of socialism, they would disallow things like private investment. I've got to say, this seems like a really weird false dichotomy, especially because Wolf unambiguously laid out something that fits into neither of these boxes, hmm. right? Which is that, you know, what he means by socialism is an economy that is predominantly uh, worker controlled. The, right. you know, he said there would be it would be mostly worker control with a smattering of uh, of of wage labor, and there are all kinds of legitimate ways you could you know things you could object to that Wolf didn't say enough about how you would bring that about. He didn't say you know he didn't say enough about what the mechanics would be. All fair you know criticisms, but like he did clearly give a definition that is neither what Destiny is calling strict socialism, where you completely disallow wage labor or. Uh, so so amorphous you're just describing liberal capitalism yeah and i think also importantly like it's very clear that there are ways to get to what richard wolf has advocated for without disallowing private investment or, or anything like that um like you can have private investment and just have like you know as i said earlier like tax credit incentives or preferential loans or other ways of of uh, uh, things that can coexist with private investment while also making sure that co-ops are like the predominant business model. Um, and also, I guess the, the comment about, um, I guess the comment about not moralizing economic systems was a little weird to me. Um, I, I don't really understand what he means by that. Like, I guess I get that he's like, um, so, I mean, I guess like, I get that like destiny is just like a traditional utilitarian or whatever. And so I guess the way he's looking at it is just like, I just want an economic system that produces the most stuff and then we can distribute it however else we want. But I mean, firstly, uh, most socialists are going to take uh, some sort of line such that they are just going to say that there are intrinsically immoral properties of, uh, you know, like private ownership of the means of production apart from how it distributes the resources that it creates. And it seems like just asserting like, well, no, you can't think that it has to all be about the distribution without giving some sort of like an argument for that, I guess, like normative ethical position. I guess like that just doesn't seem to give most socialists any reason to buy into that. Um, but but I mean, also, like, even if you are a utilitarian, there might still be components of capitalism that are just these huge utility drains that don't have to do with how much stuff it produces um, that, you know, uh, count against it, right? Such that it, it is an inherently immoral apart from the uh, production element. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just not super clear on, on what he meant by that. Yeah, that that seemed super weird to me. I remember it in the opening statement and, and then it kind of got lost. So I'm glad he said it again just now um, because it, it just seems so arbitrary. Like, like that just seems to be a way of saying you're not allowed to have moral objections to the way that an economic system is, is organized that like, you're not allowed to think morally about how an economy should be organized. And, and I don't know why not. Right. I mean, like, like what's the, what's the argument for not like, for not apply for not, um, 
you know, for not objecting to, uh, to, to any economic system on the basis of any moral principle. Like that, that, that just seems like such a weird rule. Like if, it, you know, he, it seems like, like what he's laying down is the only value that you're allowed to use when judging a form of economic organization is uh, efficiency, like productive efficiency. It's like, okay, I can see why that's one value that right. you would take into account when judging economic systems, but why on earth would it be the only value? Like it seems totally plausible to me that you could have two economic systems and one is like, you know, five or 10% less productively efficient than the other one, but the other one is better in so many other ways that like clearly overall the slightly less efficient one is better. That seems like, that seems like a bizarre thing to just disallow in principle. I mean, it's, it seems like he's, you know, and I like, I also wonder if he would even really consistently apply this. Like, you know, he doesn't like, can we not object to feudalism on moral grounds? Like is the only problem with feudalism that it's less efficient than capitalism or could there be other things that are like morally objectionable about like feudal ways of organizing production? Yeah. yeah I mean, Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, you, you could go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, one, one thought I had on this whole question of what he could mean by, by moralizing and, you know, I wonder, and, you know, Ethan could maybe speak to this is like the, the, the types of like, you know, kind of like streamer Twitch socialists that he's like used to talking to. Um, maybe they, maybe he has kind of like a straw man in his head about like really like bad claims that just like, that like, I don't know, capitalism that just like kind of reduce capitalism to being this like immoral force and don't get down into like the specifics. And then I guess like the other thought I have like kind of related to that is, I mean, there is perhaps um, an interesting question that like maybe a utilitarian would ask about, you know, what is like, for example, that like a benevolent dictator, right? Like if, if you have a dictator who's actually giving you all the outcomes that you want, mm -hmm. like what are, what are like, is there, I mean, a lot of people would argue that there is still something immoral with that, but I guess the question yeah. is like, are we moralizing like the category of something like, re which is, you know, I think maybe it's based on like a, like, I think ultimately he has a straw man in his head. That's like, that's what I'm imagining when yeah. he says we ought not moralize it because he's imagining these people who are just describing really simpleton claims that like this whole thing is immoral. Now, of course, I don't think Wolf is doing that, but that might be what he's thinking. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe like it, it just seems like the way he's putting it really makes it sound like he's saying like you can't say that capitalism is morally objectionable yeah. because of like workers lack of autonomy and and why are we gonna like why not right i mean like mm -hmm. like as as ethan points out i mean even if you're um uh even if you like even if you are like a pure utilitarian about morality which you shouldn't be i mean it's a silly position but like <laughs> you know even if you are like okay i mean it couldn't it still be true that there are like there are that there could be things about a way of organizing production like in themselves, like as opposed to the accompanying political system, you, you know, to the extent that those are separable, right. As opposed to like, whether you're doing anything later to redistribute the results, but like, could it just be true that there are things about the way that you're organizing production and your society that like lead to unnecessary mm -hmm. suffering that, 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 uh, you know, that like people are more miserable because like, they don't like, you know, they don't like, you know, having to follow orders from people that they have no power over all day. I mean, like that, that, that seems like a weird thing to just rule out in principle. Yeah, ex exactly. That's, that's actually the, the example I was going to go to is, is something like alienation, right? Where you could, mm. I mean, you could make a super plausible utilitarian argument that alienation is like this huge utility drain. Um, and so, and, and it doesn't seem to be directly having to do with, how effectively you know how efficient capitalism is at producing stuff right so it just seems like like i guess i had like a, a multi-tiered reaction when i first heard him say that which is like firstly like there seem to be all sorts of super plausible like normative ethical theories like if let's say you're like a pluralist consequentialist and like some of the things that you value just are like self-management or just are like community or just are like de uh, democratic control over the institutions that affect people's lives, right? Like that seems like a fairly plausible moral position to hold. And clearly someone who has that position 
would have all kinds of reasons for saying that capitalism might be inherently immoral outside of the the way it produces stuff. Um, but in addition to that, it's like, yeah, like like even if you are, if you, even if you do reject those views, and even if you are utilitarian, it's not clear to me that the only way in which capitalism impacts utility is in terms of its productive capacities. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it almost just feels like it almost feels self-defeating, like according to his own like normative position. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's a, kind of a weird claim. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess so. The the like distinction I had in mind a little bit is like you know the the like the process versus the outcome, right? So, you know, obviously there's good reason to say that capitalism leads to the outcome of of like the feeling of or the experience or even the structure of alienation. Um, but that's like the outcome, right? And I think maybe there's like a, there's a, there's a separation he wants to make, which I don't think I would agree with that. Like, you know, the, 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 we should just think about the outcomes and like the process is whether there's a connection between the process and the outcome is, I guess, an empirical question to explore. If that makes sense. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, but like also like, I guess, I guess one way of like put it, I think the point that Ethan and I both drive it at is like, okay, so if the outcome like since it seems like destiny's picture is just you should just have whatever economic system uh that you that is gonna like you know be most productively efficient and then if that leads to bad outcomes in terms of like you know really bad inequalities in 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 like income or you know or or uh people you know people Alienation. not yeah, people not having their basic needs met, then like you can like redistribute later. But like you should just have the initial production be uh, whatever's most efficient. Mm, yeah. And to the extent that is his position, and by the way, I suspect that like under interrogation about this, I could be wrong, but I suspect he would actually probably be willing to like put in a few caveats to that, right? Like, um, probably if it turned out that like a system of indentured servitude was like the, the most efficient way we could organize the economy, he'd probably say, okay, I guess you can't do that. Right. So it's like probably his real position is, well, as long as you're respecting certain rights, then like whatever the most efficient way of doing it is, is the way you should do it. And then like just redistribute away the results later. But it's like, okay, one, if that is his position, then all right, great. Then you've just like, fine. But what we're arguing about is like, what rights should you have to respect? <laughs> you know, before you uh, before you pick the most efficient way to do it, uh, and that could include like like uh, like Ethan has said, you know, things about you know workplace democracy or whatever. But like, two, why should we like forget that for a second? Like, why should we like only be morally concerned with distributive inequality, uh, or or with like you know suffering that results from distribution of the goods that are produced? I mean, by the way, I'd argue even if that is the only thing we should be concerned about, that itself gives you a reason to be, be a socialist because, you know, large scale inequalities and in distribution are usually downstream from, from inequalities and in power at the point of production. But like, whatever, even if ignoring that too, right? Like, let's say you could fix all the distributive inequalities through like taxation and redistribution, or whatever. Okay. Like, even if we accept that, I think, wrong premise. Right. Like, I think, like, just as a matter of how, uh, I think realistically it could never work that way. Like it could, it could and can to a certain extent, but I, I don't think you'd ever completely fix the problem that way. But like, why is it that we should only be concerned with like distribution? Like why, why, why is it that like the place that people have to spend half of their waking lives most days of the week is like how things work there is just completely off the table morally. Yeah. And additionally, I mean, building on on the point you made about equality, it just seems like the only way that argument would work. So like if he's saying like the only moral objection we could raise is with like distributive equality. And so then we should just have the economic system that produces the most stuff and then subsequently, you know, redistribute it in, in the way that's that's most fair. I mean, in order for that for that premise to lead to the conclusion that neither capitalism nor socialism are inherently more immoral, he would have to uh, he would have to assume that uh, just having capitalism and then uh, doing redistribution 
is likely to lead to <laughs> the same amount of equality as if we had socialism. But obviously, I don't think any socialist would accept that that premise. Right. So it's like you'd you'd have to make an argument for that, right? Yeah, totally. Like, like I, I think, I, I mean, I guess what Destiny would say is like, okay, I, I mean, I think the best version of Destiny's position would be to say that, you know, I don't know if it's what he'd say or not, but I mean, what he should say, right, would be that, okay, maybe you can't have as much distributive equality given capitalist ownership relations, but like it's worth it, you know, because because you'll have so much more efficiency and ultimately the floor will raise or something like that, right? Like, and that's, you know, like, like that would be, um, and that's fine, right? We could argue about that, right? Whether, whether it would be worth it or not, but like, that's, again, I, I just don't understand why. Um, and even though, like, I, I, I just think you'd be wrong about that too. Right. I mean, like, I think that you are going to have what I would regard certainly as like wildly unacceptable levels of distributive equality under under anything that was like you know fundamentally a capitalist economy but um and i don't think that like a, a sort of reasonable form of socialism that we could like feasibly imagine in the near future would be so much worse for efficiency you know that 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 wouldn't be worth it but like again i, I just don't understand what principled reason there could be for saying that the only things that we get to the only values that we that we should possibly apply when thinking about economics are efficiency and and distributive equality. Like, yeah, those are those are two ones that are important. But like, you know what? Like, personal autonomy isn't important. Like, just just like suffering, like coming, like you know, people being miserable because like they're so alienated, you know, because of their lack of autonomy at work. Like, that's not important. Like, it, it seems like there could be like tons of things that are like plausibly morally important that he's just like ruling out with this like weird diktat about like, you know, you're not allowed to moralize economic structures. All right. I let's go back and watch the last few minutes of this. And I guess it bothers me because some innovations and things have existed only under the framework of capitalism that even with public research and public pushing, you weren't able to get. For instance, I believe the LED was discovered um, or was invented in, in, in Russia like 100 years ago. And it wasn't until Western private enterprise took a hold of that invention and started utilizing it that anybody was able to actually enjoy the invention. All right. Thank you. And now, Professor Wolf, closing statements. You have three minutes. Sure. I think it's very hard for people to break out of the straitjacket that capitalism, having existed for 300 years, imposes on us, often unconsciously, often through the medium of our parents, our teachers, and so forth. Uh, I respect that. That's difficult. Human beings have a hard time doing that. I'm included. But I think that what is unique here is that all those problems of American capitalism that Steve just listed. The difference is whether you see those as distinct problems that you as a good liberal think that the government could address or that some institutional adjustment could address. People who had looked at the inequalities, the instability, the injustices of capitalism have tried that for a long time and it doesn't work. The fact of the matter is we have more inequality now than we had 10, 40, and 60 years ago. That's the system that we live in. It's as though what the liberal does is look for every possible explanation other than that the basic system is the problem and system change is the solution. And one last effort to clarify, since it seems murky for Steve. The difference I advocate is a radical transformation of the workplace so that the person who comes to work is no longer overwhelmingly an employee, a drone, told where to sit and what to do with what machine on what occasion, and then at the end of the day is told, go home, what happens to what you help to produce is none of your business. That transforming that into a collective community that democratically decides so that every worker has two job descriptions, the particular task and your equal participation in running, designing, and organizing the enterprise. That is a liberation of human capability. 
It is a transformation of life from the bottom up and represents a kind of socialism which, were it to be achieved, would be a control on the government so it does what the people need and not get shifted off to other things that sustain the state as against the people. That's a lesson learned from the earlier socialisms that the newer socialisms have incorporated. The mass of people will determine, as capitalism, especially in the United States, declines, whether, when, and how to move forward, but the yearning to do better than we're doing in US capitalism, that's already a fact. It's now only a question where it'll go. That's time. The very fact that this conversation is happening and that someone like me was invited to participate is itself a sign of where things are going. All right, thank you so much for participating in this on both parts. Uh, would either of you like to plug any of your current social projects or uh, what you have going on? Um, I'm good. Okay, Richard. All I would say, if anyone is interested in the kinds of things I have to say, uh, we maintain a website, democracyatwork.info. From there, you can find everything that we do. Uh, very simple. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I don't know. I liked. Uh, um, I think it got a little bit vague at the end, but uh, but but if it had like, I think if if Wolf's statement had ended like forty seconds earlier, I was just you know I I think like no lies detected would have would have been mm -hmm. a, a sufficient summation, but uh, but maybe maybe since it was a little vague at the end, you know there are reasonable criticisms to be made here. Yeah, I mean, I th I liked. I liked overall what Wolf said. It was it was a nice a nice vision. Um, and and you know I'm not to like repeat myself again, but I just wish there was more discussion about how we were going to get there. I think at one point earlier, de uh, yeah, like Destiny made this point that, I, and I'm kind of like having flashbacks to when I first watched this debate, and it is it is quite a different experience actually the second time where I actually do feel. I mean, I feel like it was like le even less substantive, maybe, but also I think like I feel a lot more strongly that 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 Wolf uh, had made a lot more uh, persuasive points. I think originally I felt like a little bit more divided about like because because I was so fixated on the fact that they weren't actually talking about the issue that I wanted them to talk about. Um, but yeah, I think at one point Destiny said something, you know, a lot of socialists don't want to admit the kind of like coercion or something like that that would be necessary for certain things. And, you know, I know Ethan, Ethan brought up some, some incentives, but I think, you know, that's, that's the meat of the question. Uh, how would that work? Um, that didn't get, and I'm just repeating myself what I said before, but that is the meat of the question that didn't get answered. Um, that's like my main takeaway, I suppose. Um, uh, and I, 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 but, but I did enjoy seeing, uh, you know, Pro professor Wolf, his personality come through, um, with some of, some of his own, his own brand of kind of owns were, were enjoyable to watch. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree with the um with the coercion point. Like, well, it's, I mean, it's kind of bizarre because I feel like um, like the issue really that's at stake is just is like wage labor ethically problematic, right? Because if it is, then obviously it's okay to coerce. Like, uh, I don't think Destiny has a problem with us saying you're not allowed to like if you're gonna start a business it can't be one wherein you're sexually harassing your employees, mm -hmm. right? Like we're okay with coercively in enforcing that standard, right? And so like, I mean, really, it just seems like the point of contact is whether there is something ethically problematic about this uh, hierarchical arrangement at the workplace. Yeah, I think that is probably the, the core of their, um, of their difference. Although I, I will, I mean, whatever, I'm, I'm just going to be, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think it's something all three of us have said a bunch of times tonight, which is that I think what this sort of, like this is the kind of debate that actually makes me wish 
that like I was watching like some like old fashioned debate at like, you know, in like the dining hall at Cambridge or something where they like read out the proposition at the beginning, you know, like <laughs> and everybody referred back to it a bunch of times over the course of it. Cause it's like, I, I would just be fascinated to know what the like proposition is that you could summarize that like all of this was about, right? <laughs> like, so a lot of it seems to be about what Ethan just said. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, like it's definitely like a lot of what they were disagreeing about. I do think some of what they were disagreeing about was whether you can just sort of like, um, like reform away the defects of capitalism without changing the fundamental economic structure. I mean, that's the point that Wolf ended on, and and it does seem like that's some of what they're disagreeing about, right? Because like I, I think that part of what Destiny is saying and the in what we were just working out a few minutes ago about how you know you can't more shouldn't moralize economic structures like i i don't understand like i don't think that there's a charitable reading of that that doesn't include don't worry we could just sort of we could just reform away you know the bad effect of of capitalism uh so so we shouldn't be like you know we shouldn't be moralizing about capitalist economic structures you know we should just accept this as like something we need for economic efficiency and then we can you know, and then we can reform away the bad results. In which case, I think, like, Wolf's response at the end is, like, very powerful and on point, right? Like, it's like, well, hold on, like, you know, which is basically like, okay, guys, how's that going, right? Like, you know, we we have, you know, we have more distributive inequality now, you know, than, than we had than we had in the 1960s. So, you know, um, that's, that's, that's not going to work. But then, like, also some of the debate was about, you know, I don't know whether how to define socialism and some of the debate was about whether Russia or Japan, you know, had more economic growth in the mid 20th century. And, and I, I definitely found like the last couple subjects, like way less interested in the first two. Yeah, totally. Totally. You know who you, you know, what show used to have such great of those kinds of debates that you uh, wished it was, was, uh, will, uh, strangely like William F. Buckley, his old show. Yeah. Uh, Fire and line. line. Yep. Man, it had great. Those had great debates on that, uh, on that show. It just made me think of that. Cause I feel like I always thought that was like, um, some, some pretty high quality, uh, like content. I think it was even PBS. Um, yeah, it was PBS. Well, I think it's actually really important that it was PBS because I think ironically, given Buckley's political views, I don't think Fire and line could have existed on a non-public television uh, network. Yeah. I, because I agree. You know, like they would have just been like, well, shit, like what, what the people are going to get bored and they're going to click away before the commercials, you know, <laughs> like that's, you know, like, but because it's PBS, there was room for these like really good, interesting, in depth discussions. Yeah, I love, like, I mean, Buckley is like a strange and sinister clown, but like, I, I, I kind of love Fire in Line. Like, we've done like a couple of those. Oh, I yeah, think they're, they're <laughs> for, great. It's, it's interesting though that like, um, it's true that at that time you would have needed PBS to do it, but it, one, I guess, optimistic point about the age we live in now is like the fact that you yeah. exist. It's like there right. is, is clearly an appetite for long form uh, engagement with 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 ideas. So yeah, definitely. I mean, look, not to not to um, you know, I guess I am going to open it, but I, I'm hoping that I can close it again in thirty seconds. Like you know, but like you know. The Joe Rogan experience is way more popular than CNN. And those are like three hour conversations, you know, like that does, that does it tell you something, something about people's. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's, I think there's a ton of appetite for this. And yeah, I actually, I, I agree with you. I mean, like, I think that um, like within the limits of television as a medium, you could have only had pie fire, you know, you could have only have had fire in line and PBS or some equivalent like public entity. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I think clearly now with podcasts and YouTube, you know, like like there are, you know, there are more openings like this is the I mean, this is, you know, I think the technological change is like really bad in lots of ways. Right. You know, that that the the way that it's result, like I think the economic collapse of traditional media, you know, which which was brought about to a great extent by those technological changes has been like kind of a weird like spiraling economic like uh, epistemic catastrophe right you know that 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 everybody everybody is able to like order their own little media diets a la carte and like never interact with what any you know yeah. like any sources of information that might undermine their worldview and all that stuff it's it's like that's awful right like and, yeah. and i you know I, I don't love all of his like 
more recent political commentary, but but I think Matt Taibbi's book Hate Inc. is is one I'm always recommended about this. And I think it's really good on it. Agreed. Right? I read it as well. Great book. Mm-hmm. Um, like I think he's ex- like exactly on point. Like I don't I don't I don't think Taibbi himself would think of what he's doing this way. But like I think it's like essentially like a really good materialist analysis of like what's wrong with with contemporary media and how that gives you these like stupid eternal culture wars. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, point, point, point to him for writing that book for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so it's, so again, in many ways it's a catastrophe, but like that is definitely a good thing about it. Right. I mean that, yeah, this, this channel can exist, you know, that, that, uh, that there can be, uh, like both that you can have openings for, um, like distant perspectives that, you know, like wouldn't, you know, like back when you had like, you know, 60 million people or whatever watching Walter Cronkite talk about Vietnam, uh, then uh, like that was good because people weren't epistemically siloed, but it was also like really bad for all the reasons that Chomsky and Herman were talking about, you know, that, uh, that like any kind of like useful dissident perspective was just like completely frozen out of it. That like to find that stuff, you had to be reading like zines that people were making with Xerox <laughs> machines. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> and I mean, nowadays, you know, Ethan on, you could go to Ethan's channel and you can see that he's got, uh, you know, like a, like a, like a three and a half hour defensive egalitarian justice that has like, I don't know, 3000 views or something like. Yeah. Totally, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it's cool. Yeah. I was surprised yeah. that I was surprised about that. It's like, it did pretty well. Who wants to like listen to me talk about like Cohen and Rolls for like three hours, but apparently <laughs> like enough people, you know? Yeah. 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 No, I think so. Um, you should um, you should come on and do a um, do a um, a patron episode on that on the uh, the the Cohen Rawls debate. I think that'd be really interesting. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting debate. I think I talked with um, I, t- I briefly talked about that with uh, Victor and Matt uh, a while ago. It's an interesting conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think I think that's that's something I'd I'd definitely. Um, uh, I definitely be up for, uh, I've, I've spent like, um, like there's a lot of stuff that I'm supposed to be writing right now that I'm like way behind on. And they're, they're like books I'm supposed to have written reviews of, that review you know. of, uh, of, of American Marxism. Yeah. But Victor, you don't know how hard it is to, to get, to like push through that book. It's, it's so <laughs> I, I, I keep trying you know, to, to force myself to finish yeah. reading it. It will happen, but it's, yeah. it's painful. You don't have the, you don't have the, the kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, resiliency that Matt McManus has, I guess. <laughs> I have nothing like the resiliency that Matt McManus has. Like he just, he, he just like eats shit like that for breakfast. I have no <laughs> idea how he does it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I read, I read, I do like make myself like read a couple of conservative books a year, just like kind of keep myself honest and see what they're saying. But like, yeah. um, but it, it's so mind boggling. It's so hard. Like, and I and I tried. Um, one thing that I tried, you know, so so I could finish my half of the review. Bad guy, you're supposed to write of that. Like, one thing I try is like, okay, sometimes with like books where the writing is kind of shitty and like, I have trouble, you know, getting through it. Like I'll just like start, like I'll just jump start it by, by, you know, getting it on audible and like listening to it, like while I'm walking the dog and washing dishes and whatever. And then like that way I'll like, you know, consumed enough of it. I can go back and read it and like finish it quickly. And I tried to do that with American Marxism, the Mark Levin book. And, but the problem is that Mark Levin narrates the book. So it's, so I realized really quickly it was just going to be 10 hours or something and Mark Levin screaming at me and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> oh, God. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not. It's good. funny, though, Matt McMahon. It's like he, he because he's read so many conservative books. It's just like funny that he'll sometimes come to me and be like, you know, this James Lindsay book is like not that bad just because, <laughs> you know, in relative to all the other shit he's reading, it's just like funny his whole like kind of like criteria for judging what's good is like, I feel like warped by just what he puts himself through. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the screenshots I've seen from the Lindsay book have been brutal, Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but I will say they're not, they, I mean, they really aren't as bad as American Marxism. Like American Marxism is just this like very screamy guy, just like transcribing like Ugh. what, what he, what he does and like stitching together, like copied and pasted quotes to like pat it out. And, and yeah. it, 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 it's, 
it's rough going. Well, now I'm confused because Matt said it was great. So I'm getting like conflicting. <laughs> <laughs> God. Um, yeah, I mean, like, like for perspective, I read the entirety, every single page of the right side of history, how uh, uh, reason and uh, moral purpose made the uh, West great by Ben Shapiro. And like compared to American Marxism, that's like, I don't even know. Yeah, that's a masterpiece. <laughs> like that's, that's, uh, that's great. Like, you know, I have, uh, and at the time I thought that that was like, um, I thought that was bad. Like I, I had, like, I, I read the, I actually, you know, go back to William F. Buckley, read a bit. I just called him a sinister clown, but I read God and Man at Yale right after I read uh, the right side of history. I was like, Oh my God, he's such a good writer. This is great. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, totally. I love that. <laughs> you know, cause like, he probably yeah. was at least a good writer. Um, no, he actually legitimately was, yeah. was yeah. A, a good writer, you know, but like, like, you know, not, um, you know, not an amazing one or whatever, but a good one, you know, like, like, mm-hmm. like legitimately, like that's, uh, he's like, he has a good style. It makes it easy to get through, you know, like, but, uh, whereas Shapiro, like probably not literally true, but Shapiro, and by the way, I will say, I do believe he wrote the book. Uh, <laughs> you know, I also read, by the way, another book I was able to get through, uh, was arguing with socialists, uh, by Glenn Beck. So <laughs> you got through that or you were, you were yeah, no, I got through it. I, I read it. I, I co-wrote a review of it with Nathan Robinson, the current affairs. So, uh, um, okay, nice. I, um, and that one Glenn Beck absolutely did not write, but like the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the right side of history, I believe that Ben Shapiro wrote it. Uh, and I can just visual like reading it. What I kept thinking is like, probably not literally true but it really feels like he had a stack of three by five cards like next to him as he was writing with like where he'd written down these quotations that he wanted to include in the book and, like, <laughs> you know the yeah. person who said it and their birth and death dates you know because like every fucking time he like brings up a new thinker and like drops in a little quote from them it feels like that like middle school book report style where you know you're like you know they well, you know, as, you know, David Hume, who lived from 17, you know, whatever. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It's, it's not, it's yeah. not good. Yeah, that reminds me. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go. Oh, no, I was just going to to put a cap on that uh, topic. It, I mean, with respect to, like, right-wing writers, I remember one time... I had a friend who was like trying to get me to read Nozick and I did it. And I was like, he was like, Nozick's great. You like, you'll, he'll impress you. He's like this great writer. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty good, but like, ultimately I'm not convinced. Like I'm not, I I wasn't close to being convinced, but I mean, it was like kind of interesting, but I don't know why you hyped it up so much. And then he was like, all right, go read any other right wing writer and then come back to me. (laughs) And like, you'll understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I will say, like, Nozix, you know, like, Anarchy State Utopia is, like, I mean, I, I find the uh, the core, you know, argument of the book, like, radically unconvincing, um, because I just, like, there's just never a point where he gives me a reason to think that, like, this is the only moral principle we should care about, yeah. and they're all the familiar problems about how the economic history of the real world has absolutely nothing in common with what it would have to be for the theory to be applicable and blah, blah, blah. Right. Like all of that. But like, also there are good points in that book, right? Like there, there Mm -hmm. are in fact individual arguments in the book. Like none of them are really, you know, very closely, like very closely linked to that, like overall argument that we should all believe in, you know, we should all advocate a, you know, libertarian minimal state and let people starve and all that. But like, there are arguments that he makes along the way, like, you know, arguments against utilitarianism and things like that, that are actually like convincing arguments that like, mm-hmm. that I, I, you know, like, I think, you know, I think the experience machine, like, okay, no, you know, like, like that's, mm-hmm. that's actually like a really good argument. You're totally right about that, you know, but like, um, which alone, which alone does differentiate it from, you know, any of the people that yeah, we're, right, that of course. we're yeah. talking about, right? I mean, there's no, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like we just said, like 
and also like Nozick is an unusually like good writer for an analytic philosopher too. I think you have to give him that. But like, yeah, for sure. Is he? Would he even call him right wing, or is he kind of right wing in the philosophical sense that he's just like a liber- philosophical libertarian, right? Well, he was a political libertarian. I mean, he basically was like a like a minarchist, um, or like or like um my, who, Michael Humer, who you debated once, Ben. Right? Yeah, like yep. he's kind of a. I guess he's like a, a libertarian also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a he's a libertarian. I think he actually. Uh, I think Humer. He seems uh, super good faith. I watched that debate. Like he just. Yeah. I mean, it's just so different than any other debate with a so called libertarian. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like yeah. I mean, he's obviously much smarter, and he's also. Uh, that like a sort of normal internet libertarian and and also he's yeah I, mean, I, I think it is very good faith but like it's um but i think he actually might be an even more extreme libertarian than knows like it's a, it's unclear to me yeah i think he was an ancap yeah i think i think he is right like at mm-hmm. the very least he's flirting with that you know like he but i think he probably is mm-hmm. um so so yeah i mean like like yeah knows it could humor are like the best of those guys because they're like you know, good philosophers who just like happen to have some like twisted moral values and that like lead them to these like demented right wing, you know, conclusions about economics. Mm-hmm. But like, um, but they're, they're still like making like very careful arguments and, you know, like making a good faith effort to figure out how to get from A to B and all that stuff. They ask interesting philosophical questions. Like, totally. you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it is, it is worth asking, you know, what, what really are the conditions that justify, uh, like in a, in a in an actual philosophical way that like justify like the state's existence, the state's ability to oh, force sure. you. For sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with I, I I wholeheartedly agree with with what Ben said. Like when my when I read Nozick, my original impression was like, okay, it feels like this guy is just telling me if you accept at the outset this libertarian conception of what <laughs> rights people have, then you'll draw libertarian conclusions. And it's like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's like um, Alvin Plantinga, uh, who, who for anybody who's not familiar, is is this. Uh, uh, he's he's a analytic epistemologist and philosopher of religion, uh, who who's also you know like a hardcore Calvinist, and uh, and he he wrote this trilogy of books uh, called was it Warrant the Current Debate, which is about like epistemic warrant, like justification. Second one is uh, is uh, warranted proper belief or something. I'm slightly messing up the name of the warranted proper function. I think that's it. And then the third one, which is like this this huge book, is called Warranted Christian Belief. <laughs> right. So it's like it's all about like his view, but also it's the weirdest damn thing because it's like um, like I think literally the last sentence of that book is. Uh, if, you know, we have, uh, you know, if like Christianity is, is true, then we can know that God exists. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would have accepted that if that had been the first sentence, right? I mean, like that, yeah. that would have yeah. been totally fine. Oh yeah. I mean, I, it's so Pretty bizarre because Alan Plan, uh, Alvin Plantiga, I mean, in general, I think he's usually super insightful i mean i a lot of his uh arguments i think are some of the best arguments like from apologists yeah. but at the same time like the uh the mo- the modal ontological argument is probably the most aggressive example of like the kind of thing you're talking about right. where he's like if god possibly exists then god exists and then by possibly i mean like metaphysical possibility <laughs> and that just means that you already accept god exists and it's like <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly the thing, you know, because it's like I think that people, um, like, whereas I think there's a certain there's a, like I think I think a lot of people who are already Christians uh, are get excited about Planaga because he gives them like an intellectually rigorous like framework for like how to think about what they already believe. But I think a lot of people who are just like sort of religious seekers are like super disappointed when they read Planica because like what they assume they're going to get is him actually like giving them a new reason to think that <laughs> Christian beliefs are true. And he's just like, not in that business at all. Right. You know, <laughs> it's just like, well, given my view that, you know, that like basically, you know, that you can like, this isn't exactly right, but it's like roughly his view. Right. You know, given my view that like the right way to think about knowledge is reliabilism, you know? So 
uh, and and given this Christian theology where you know the Holy Spirit operates within you, then like you know you, the Holy Spirit causes you to have like Christian beliefs, and that that means that it's reliably caused, which means that it counts as knowledge. <laughs> it's like I mean, even if you're right about every single element of that, that's just like not what people are looking for. You know, yeah. when they go to read this stuff, they think yeah. that you're gonna they think that you're gonna prove to them that God exists, and He's just like not trying to do that really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we are at, we are at about midnight, so we should uh, we should probably call it a night. Yeah, uh, that was a that was a long one, but a lot of fun for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, cool. Uh, I will uh, I will see both of you guys soon. Uh, I am sure uh, we are uh, we are not having uh, one of these next Thursday uh, to uh, for uh, reasons that I'm going to be coy about right now, but should be apparent by next Thursday. And um, uh, we are having one the Thursday after that. Uh, the I was actually going to do one with Nathan Robinson about um, the uh, uh, I think it was I think it was about uh, one of those firing line episodes actually. Uh, mm. Or no, actually, it's about. Uh, of course, it's the combination of the things we like here. It's the uh, it's the uh, 1980s Hitchens on firing line, uh, mm. or, you know, young leftist Hitchens argue with William yeah, yeah. Buckley. So that, that one should be one, uh, one for the ages. I've seen so, that. That's a good one. Yeah. So, uh, we were actually originally going to do that on the 17th cause we're not doing one next week. And, and I thought we were going to be doing part two of this in the 10th. So, uh, mm. maybe that'll get moved up to the 10th. I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but, uh, lots of good stuff coming up, uh, on, uh, on Mondays, GTA, uh, we've got Lillian Sikerci is back uh, to uh, talk about theories of exploitation. Um, and um, our producer, Jake, who uh, whose day job is a uh, uh, CWA organizer, is, is going to be talking about all of those Starbucks unionizations. Um, so that should uh, that should be really good. Uh, we are still going to do the one with uh, with with uh, all, all of our, uh, you know, all of the Canadians I know who aren't on screen, uh, where where we talk about Jordan Peterson, uh, I was saying we we're going to do that next Monday at one point, but that's going to be in like a couple weeks or something. I'm not sure exactly. So uh, many good things coming up. Uh, either of you guys want to plug anything before we go? Uh, I'll just say uh, you can find uh, more content from me and Matt McManus and uh, two others on the Plastic Pills podcast. Yeah, you can find me at Mouthy Infidel on YouTube. That's pretty much all that's pretty much all all right well fair enough uh so thanks again guys thank you everybody for watching left is best